It's amazing to see him in the wild like this. For those who were born to ride, there's Progressive. Imagine helping their teeth become four times stronger, preventing cavities up to 40%. Act Kids Fluoride Rinse. Stop imagining. Start acting. And get anti-cavity protection with our dye-free ice formulas. Well, things are different these days, but we're figuring it out. We're doing school online now, learning a lot. Come in, come in. Finding cool stuff to watch. Dad's got some new workout buddies. And I still get to spend time with you. Mr. Wonderful here. It's hard for everyday people to get access to startup investments. But with Start Engine, you can choose between hundreds of startups to build your portfolio. It's your turn to become a shark. Visit startengine.com today. Welcome back. If you're standing right now, you might want to sit down for what I'm about to say. Because believe it or not, Tesla is lower today. It's down more than 6%. It's its second down day now. Apple is also in the red. Apple's down 6% at the lows. It shed a Boeing in market cap. And how about Zoom? That one also following after shooting up 49% in the past three trading days. And the new Dow Darling Salesforce, it's also in the red. And this is only its second down day in two weeks. So while it may be too early to call it a trend, what are all of these declines telling us about the broader market? For more, let's welcome in CNBC Senior Markets commentator Michael Santoli, along with Michael Kantrowitz, Chief Investment Strategist at Cornerstone Macro. It's good to have you guys here. Um, Kantrowitz, I'll start with you because your note it, it makes me chuckle. You say crowding is at an extreme, but stay growthy. Why? Yeah. Well, we, we have a backdrop now where you have more crowding than ever uh, by some measures, uh, look, looking at just how crowded, how many institutional owners uh, do own stocks, what's the average stocks, and that's see there today than 1,000. The question, though, and we'll say stake the is really fundamental reason that these are crowded. And the question is, did something change today? Something, something going to change that is going to change the story uh, about why uh, investors like these stocks and really valuation has been you know the, the the single biggest issue for most of these names yet we continue to see them outperform because the fundamental story is still intact and what is that fundamental story real quick uh it's it's from a macro perspective uh it's it's a continued backdrop very interest for staying uh, staying yeah. a long time uh, it, it's a lack of stocks elsewhere. The real is in the S100. Yeah. Uh, there were only 50, 60 names that have actually won their revenue anywhere, those stocks that you just did. Right. Uh, and so it's not going to change. Investors aren't going to change. Michael Santoli, let me turn to you then. So I think essentially what Kantrowitz is saying is that you have super low interest rates. We've seen uh, even after the big Fed move last week, that's still the case. Uh, people want growth because they're not confident of where else they might get it. But is that p piece of it starting to change? When you see the better manufacturing surveys, hear about the industry's hiring. It's starting to change, Kelly, in the sense that uh, the only game in town may no longer be those long-term secular growth stories that have these durable cash flows, which have been revalued much higher given the fact that, you know, we have corporate bond yields at 2% and an easy Fed. Uh, it's actually broadened out quite a bit in the last several weeks. If you look at things like industrial and transport stocks, if you look at consumer discretionary outside of Amazon compared to more defensive things like consumer staples, those things have been trending in a positive direction, just not as dramatically. They're just not capable of piling on the amount of market cap that the huge growth stocks are. And also, let's face it they don't captivate this sort of public the excitement that you have around a handful of names that really drove them to extremes you know the setup uh, that you had for this segment presuming everyone already figures all these stocks are up every day right. that's exactly why they're not up every day like today so here so what happens now because it's one thing when you say hey you know Virgin Galactic was up and then it I mean it's it's a tiny name in the grand scheme of things but when Tesla Mike Santoli is like the, the eighth biggest stock in the world at this point. What happens if that one reverses and gives up, you know, the majority of its gains? Well, we're seeing a, a small experiment uh, in that right now. It's off the highs 
um, you know, the rest of the market. In fact, if anything, the weakness today, this reversal that you've seen to the downside and some of the momentum stocks, it's incredibly localized at the moment. I mean, yeah. it's, it's Apple, it's Tesla, it's Zoom. It's the stocks that everybody was complaining about. They were up every day going into today. And we have an overall market that's actually up. So you do have a little bit of a safety net underneath it. It can't last forever. That choreography, of course, uh, might fail at some point where you have uh, this sort of rotation and this rebalancing in other areas of the market. Uh, but I do think the fact that Apple can be down as much as it is and, and how much market cap it has and the rest of the market more or less absorbs it, you know, at least for now, it's OK, even if stuff is so overbought on the tech side that uh, even much more of a give back, a normal pullback is about 7 percent in the Nasdaq 100 right now. Extremely normal like we've had multiple times in the past few months. Hmm. And I like your point about you know, how Apple, the $2 trillion company, can be down as much as it is and the rest of the market marches higher. Like you said, we'll see if that continues. But for now, Michael Santoli, Michael Kantrowitz, thank you both very, very much uh, talking about Momo in this market. Still ahead, high-end bicycle maker Trek has seen record sales during the pandemic. The CFO on why two wheels are so hot right now and the Trek products consumers can't get their hands on. You can always watch or listen to us live on the go on the CNBC app. We're back in a couple. When the world gets complicated, a lot goes through your mind. How long will this last? Am I prepared for this? Are we prepared for this? With Fidelity Wealth Management, your dedicated advisor can give you straightforward advice and tailored recommendations. With access to tax-smart investment strategies designed to help you keep more of what you've earned. So you'll know you're doing what you can for your family and your future. That's the clarity you get with Fidelity Wealth Management. The nation's jobs picture. Did the resurgence of the virus catch up with the resurgent job market? Or did business reopenings put more Americans back to work? August numbers, Friday on Squawk Box. And now watch Squawk Box anytime on demand. Prescription eyewear can be really expensive. But here's a secret. Glasses don't actually cost that much to make. Surprise! Especially when you design your own eyewear and then sell it directly to your customers. Like we do. Oh, hi. We're Warby Parker. Our glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. And the best part? You can try five pairs for free at warbyparker.com. Today, baldness can be optional. With Hims, I have my hair back, and I feel awesome. With Hims, I've got my confidence back. Hims made it so easy, and I love the results. Get a 90-day money-back guarantee at 4 Just always thought dog food is dog food. Didn't really piece together that dogs eat food. As soon as we brought the farmer's dog in, her skin was better. She was more active, high-quality poops. If I can invest in her health and be proactive, I think it's worth it. As the pandemic changes the way we commute, people have been scrambling to buy bicycles, causing major shortages. City or suburb, it's nearly impossible to find bikes, particularly Trek bikes. The surge in demand coincided almost immediately with the lockdowns. According to NPD Group, bike sales sort of whopping 75% in April, and it's not showing a lot of signs of stopping. Sales are sustaining those gains up 63% in June. With me now is Chad Brown. He's the CFO and Vice President of Retail at Trek. Chad, it's good to see you. And bike theft, by the way, is up big time because people are trying to get their hands on this stuff. Yeah, well, uh, when you buy your bike, also buy a lock. Yeah, exactly. Um, before diving into that aspect of this, tell me, first of all, you know, we've talked about how Amazon says it's basically every day is Prime Day or Apple says, you know, the last quarter they were selling computers as if it were Christmas. I mean, what's this period been like for you guys? You know, th this year is really two different periods. The, the, the first part of the year, the, the, the bike business has been doing well for a, a couple of years now. And really up through, uh, you know, the, the first two weeks of March, things were up 10, 15 percent as an industry. Things were going well. And then, you know, the bike season really starts about March 15th. So like Christmas Eve, 
things started shutting down. And as uh, bike shops were deemed essential retail, uh, very quickly we saw uh, some really unique uh, shopping patterns and demand that first couple weeks in April just took off for us. The inflection point was really Easter weekend, that April 12th date. Uh, we looked at our week, weekend sell-through reports and, and what was happening in the market, and it was just soaring. So yeah. it's really been a, a rocket ship since then. I imagine it's some people maybe using it as an alternative way uh, to commute if they don't want to, you know, do it. Maybe an Uber or a, a mass transit or something. A lot of it though is recreational, and we've seen people on bikes constantly streaming through the neighborhood. In fact, we tried to get a bike in those little ride-along things for toddlers, and we were told by our local bike shop not only leave don't even bother asking but don't even bother coming back for a couple of months because they said there's no supply why is the supply of bikes totally unable to keep up with the demand yeah well i'm so sorry that you had that uh, experience i would love to have you into one of our truck retail stores or one of our <laughs> truck uh, retailers you know the uh the, the boom happened and really early on we saw like after everyone bought the toilet paper, they bought kids' bikes and then entry-level mountain bikes. Mm -hmm. And then as supply started to get tight, it worked its way up. Um, you know, from, from our perspective, we took a wait-and-see approach as, the, uh, as both the pandemic took hold as well as the surge in uh, demand. And, you know, we're still shipping out tens of thousands of bikes, you know, every week. So there are bikes out there, I promise. Call your store, reach out to your truck retailer. There are bikes available. Uh, and there are a lot more on the way. There are a lot more on the way. You know, the, the early shutdown in Asia uh, part of this year uh, did have a little bit of a hiccup in the supply. But I promise you there are a lot more bikes on the way. Yeah, the only options that we had, you could ha get this sort of uh, oddly tall one with these really high handlebars. I mean, they had a couple, but, but not really anything great to pick from. So how do you think this sets you guys up for the future? Because if now every household has purchased a bike, does that mean we're going to have a big hangover and things become unusually slow for a period of time? You, you know, we're still seeing, uh, when, when you look at indicators like uh, foot traffic and call volume and even just website traffic, we're still seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of pent-up demand. There are um, you know, there are empty slots on some of uh, the, the, the bike shop floors, uh, but there are a lot of people that have bikes on orders, and a lot of the bikes that are, you know, being delivered to the stores are maybe already spoken for, or the, the shop has an idea of who might already be interested in that. Uh, there are a lot of bikes coming, though. I promise you, that, you know, come Christmas time, uh, you know, if a kid wants a bike or if you're looking for, um, you know, something for a, a friend or a partner, yeah. any bikes available. And I, I think, you know, we're looking at this as an amazing opportunity. There are all these people that are on bikes now, whether they're using it for recreation or transportation yeah. or, or just as a way to social distance. It's such a great opportunity to get people outside and off screens, uh, you know, enjoying the bicycle. Yeah, and you guys think it'll stick. My message to me is there are a lot of bikes on the way, <laughs> and we'll look forward to that. Yeah, say, head, head, head just south to our store in Edgewater. Yeah, and, uh, I don't know. You're they're a little too upscale for our needs, but Chad, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. Chad Brown Thank of you. Trek joining us today. That does it for the exchange. After this, the Fed's latest read on the economy, the Beige Book. Don't go anywhere. This is what it's like wearing regular shoes. No all-around support. And this is what it's like in Skechers' new Arch Fit footwear. It's all the comfort and support you need. Rita, snacks, hot towel. It's good to have support. Try Skechers Arch Fit, podiatrist certified arch support. Our economy is fueled by dynamic workplaces where the impossible becomes possible, where individuals reach their full potential. Sherm impacts the lives of 115 million workers and their families every day. And together, we can build a world of work that works for all. That is our vision, to advocate for better policies, elevate human resources, and develop stronger managers. Still, the workplace needs work. By creating better workplaces, we are truly creating a better world. We love our new home. There's so much space. We have a guest room now. But we have ants. You're slouching again, Ted. Expired. 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 Thanks, Aunt Bonnie. It's a lot of house. 
I hope you can keep it clean. At least GEICO makes bundling our home and car insurance easy. Which helps us save a lot of money. Oh, Teddy, did you get my friend request? Oh, I'll have to check. Aunt Joni's here! For bundling made easy, go to GEICO.com. Mr. Wonderful here. It's hard for everyday people to get access to startup investments. But with Start Engine, you can choose between hundreds of startups to build your portfolio. It's your turn to become a shark. Visit startengine.com today. So this year's election is going to be a little different. And how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. But how, when, and where you cast your ballot all depends on your state. This year, plan your vote. Good day, everybody, and welcome to Power Lunch. I'm Tyler Matheson. We start with record highs on Wall Street. S&P and NASDAQ both hitting all-time highs, and the Dow is up 300 points, as you see there. The Federal Reserve about to release its eagerly awaited beige book, which will give us a closer look at the economy region by region. We'll bring you those details as soon as we get them. Plus, Wingstop flying high. Shares of that fast, casual restaurant up 275% from the March lows. The CEO will be here to tell us how he and his company delivered. Plus, the University of Arizona claiming it has found a new way to prevent COVID outbreaks, testing the sewage coming from dorm rooms. President Robert Robbins will join us as Power Lunch begins right now. I cannot wait for that story. Uh, stocks are near the highs of the session right now as we wait for the beige book from the Fed. The S&P and NASDAQ are on track for their sixth straight week of gains. Dom Chu has more on these markets. Dom? All right, so the Dow is up almost 300 points at this stage near the highs of the session. More importantly, we're creeping closer to the Dow actually reclaiming record territory. We're just about 2% below those record high levels in the Dow. Meanwhile, anybody who's been tuned into Power Lunch or CNBC in general over the, the last several months knows that we continue to kind of make these record highs. With the S&P 500 gold star there, it's at a new record high. The NASDAQ always kind of creeping higher here. It's at a new record high. Believe it or not, that 12,000 mark was hit early today. It opened up at 12,000 50, roughly that level, 47 is the exact number, but still watching that NASDAQ composite. And just to put things in perspective, if you look at the NASDAQ over the last year, from the lows that we saw during the pandemic up until where we are right here, we're talking about north of 80% gains for the S&P or for the NASDAQ. You match that with the S&P 500, which is up a very healthy and respectable 60% during that time span. The NASDAQ really starting to outperform. One of the main reasons why, a lot of the momentum names we've come to associate with the markets are part of that NASDAQ. Salesforce, Tesla, Zoom, zooming higher over the last couple of days to recent highs. Now they're pulling back a bit. We'll watch if that momentum swings to the downside. Kel, I'll send things back over to you and Tyler. All right, Dom, thanks. Let's go right to Steve Leesman for the headlines from the Beige Book today. Steve? Uh, thank you, Kelly. Um, excuse me one second. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Steve, Steve, we can give you a moment, sir. We'll come back in just a second. Steve Leesman has the, the task of trying to comb through it all to get the timing right, uh, Ty. Now, the, it, it's much more difficult than it was before. Yeah, no, it is because we're not really right there, so he needs some time to just pick it up. What we're going to... What, are we going to go back to him right now? Okay, he's, uh, he's been able to read the entire book. He's a serious <laughs> speed reader. Yeah, sorry about that. That's all right, I man. hit a bad button. Economic activity, economic activity increased across most districts, but gains were generally modest, and activity remained well below levels prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Consumer spending picked up, sparked by strong vehicle sales. There was some improvement in tourism and retail sectors, but many districts, this is important, noted a slowing pace of growth in these areas, and total spending remained far below pre-pandemic levels. While the overall outlook among contacts was mostly optimistic, 
A few districts noted some pessimism, continued uncertainty and volatility remit related to the pandemic seemed to be pretty widespread. Unemployment had increased overall among districts, but some districts also reporting slowing job growth and increased hiring volatility, particularly in the service industry with rising instances, this is important, of furloughed workers being laid off permanently. Uh, that, that's what I have right now, guys. Sorry for the delay there. I hit a bad button. I'll be back to you in a few uh, seconds with a little bit more. All right. Thank you very much, Stephen. Meanwhile, uh, let's get some uh, reactions uh, to that news and to what's going on in the markets today. The, the Dow pulling back just a little bit uh, on that on those headlines. Kathy Entwistle is with us, uh, Morgan Stanley Managing Director, Private Wealth Advisor, and Samantha Azzarello, J.P. Morgan Asset Management Global Market Strategist, uh, joins us on the phone. Welcome to both of you, Kathy. Let let me begin with you. Uh, did you hear anything uh, of those headlines that really surprised you, slowing in some areas, some pessimism, generally better than the prior quarter? A lot of what we expected, didn't, isn't it? Absolutely. Nothing that we just heard surprises me at all, and I don't think it is going to surprise the market too much either. We have heard from the Fed over the last, you know, six plus months that we're having a lot of trouble in the economy. They're doing a lot to try to support it and prop it up. And also keeping interest rates low for the next probably two years is another way that they're doing this. And we should see no expectation of changes, um, you know, until the economy starts to show improvement. Samantha. Oh, go ahead, finish your thought there, Kathy. I'm sorry. No, it just might be a while. There's a lot of things going on with, you know, digital transformation companies are doing quite well, but those that have not pivoted and, you know, modified their business models to react to what's going on with the pandemic will not do well. And we will see more, more discouraging news coming if things don't change. It's really true. I, I've heard people say it in the past. It, every company must be a digital company one way or another. And these uh, past few months have certainly borne that out. Samantha, let me turn to you because you make an interesting point and you say, uh, among other things, from here, let's expect the markets to continue to grind higher, but the risks to the market are not balanced, however, with more risk to the downside. Unpack that thought. Uh, and what it means in practice. So I think if you just go back to March, right, and the way the market dropped then, the volatility we experienced then, it was the market being too pessimistic, right, about the state of the world because we lost guidance, we didn't know where we were headed, we didn't know when we would turn the economy back on. So risks were almost skewed a little bit more, I would say, to the upside. Now, you fast forward, we priced in a lot of gains, we priced in a lot of progress, and I agree with Kathy completely. Right. There's a lot more that we don't know. Right. How this all kind of plays out. And if this recovery is going to happen in fits and starts, well, guess what? The equity market's already priced in kind of a perfect, you know, going back to the letters, but almost a perfect U-shaped recovery. And I think we've realized there's no letters. This is going to be very messy. And whether it's hiring or turning the economy back on, it's going to be in fits and starts. And I just think the, the market's a little bit too optimistic. That being said, Fed support, and if we get more fiscal support, that'll allow the market to grind higher slowly. I'm going to come back to that point on fiscal support. Obviously, the uh, Fed is behind this market in a big way. Steve Leisman has more from the Beige Book. Steve? Yeah, real quick, Tyler. Uh, price pressures increased since the last report, but remained modest. Input prices generally rose faster than selling prices, uh, but they were moderate overall. One exception, uh, we talked about this this morning, inputs experiencing demand surges or supply chain disruptions, such as structural lumber. Uh, you know, the housing market's doing quite well. Uh, and just a very quick report from the New York region. The New York region says growth in the regional economy has stalled in recent week. So, uh, Tyler, we were waiting to see what happened to the economy in August as the federal um, uh, entitlements for uh, uh, unemployment rolled off uh, and as we waited for some effects of the um, uh, recent surge in, uh, happened in July to see what it showed up in August. It has, but more flat than it is down, which I think is a pretty good sign that the recovery remained robust. It's like we went backwards. We just stopped going forward at the same pace. I think that may describe the economy right now. All right. Very interesting thought there. Samantha, let me uh, turn back to you. Um, you, you, you raised the question of, of stimulus coming out of, the, uh, out of the fiscal side. Has the market priced in a probability that there either won't be a second round of stimulus or that it will be too small to make a difference? What's going on there? Is, is the market, has the market stopped counting on stimulus? 
I think the market is still counting on stimulus and the market's still counting on a vaccine and the market's still counting on a bunch of things that may or may not happen. I can tell you over the last few weeks, it's been very fast and drastic, but our probability of another fiscal stimulus plan coming out has, has gone down. So we were of the expectation that, you know, consumers would continue to be supported. We would see that unemployment come back and all of the other pieces to support the economy. That fiscal bridge is what I was calling it. There's now a lower likelihood of that happening or it's going to be piecemeal and frankly kind of messy. And again, something else that the market just seems to be ignoring. So it's not that we're, you know, anti equity. Mm -hmm. We have to keep getting invested in stocks. But I would argue I wouldn't just look to the new highs as kind of the signal to keep investing in the market. Kathy, let's get you to react there. I had dinner last night with a person who's in your business, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, who said, you know, if you're if you're not in the market, you're effectively betting against the Fed. You're betting against science, and you're and and there's that question of Tina. There is no alternative here. How do you put those three puzzle pieces together and come up with a reasonable strategy for investment today? Absolutely. First of all, we do have a dislocation in the fixed income markets and low interest rate environment. You should be taking advantage of low interest rates right now. If you're an individual consumer and you're not refinancing your mortgage or purchasing a home and using leverage to do so, that's a mistake. If you're a corporation and you have debt that is rolling out or you don't, you're not refinancing your debt, that's a mistake. And again, the people who can afford to do this, we're seeing more of that sort of split between the haves and the have-nots, which is, is an issue and will continue to be an issue going forward where the people with good balance sheets, good credit ratings and so forth are the ones that can take advantage of something like this. The ones that don't are not able to do that. And again, in terms of the conversation you had with your friend at dinner, it's all of those, it's the digital transformation stocks, it's the companies, the retail, retailers, the online e-commerce, anyone that's got that going on, those are the companies that you want to invest in going forward. And I think that, yes, we were, you know, volatile markets or markets are rising. We have to be a little bit more selective where we're going. But long-term view, absolutely, you want to be in these companies and you want to invest for the long term. All right, uh, folks, thank you so much. Kathy Entwistle, Samantha Azzarello, we appreciate your time. Kelly. Let's go to the bond market now where Rick Santelli is tracking the action at the CME. Rick, and yields have softened a bit. Yeah, and you know what? They have softened today, but unfortunately or fortunately, the catalyst really wasn't the Beige Book. Beige Book had a lot of good information, but it had a lot of buts in it. You know, consumer spending's picking up. But modestly, employment looking better, especially when you consider what's going on with manufacturing, but at a slower rate of change. The only thing that didn't have a but was residential housing is, is doing pretty well. And the market saw that. Look at a two-day of tens. And Kelly, you're absolutely right. Yesterday's low yield was about 66 basis points, and today's was until it wasn't. And the minute we started to trade below that, it gained some momentum to the downside, and now it sits at 64 basis points, down several. If you look at tens minus twos, we have what we call a bull flattening. Prices are going up, yields are going down, the yield curve's flattening. It lost about three and a half basis points today. And finally, a two-day of the dollar index. Yesterday, it traded at levels we haven't seen in 28 months. We're firming from that level, but not in an aggressive fashion. Tyler and Kelly, back to you. Rick, thank you very much. And coming up, we will have more on the markets. Right now, utilities, healthcare, and consumer staples, those are the sectors leading the way today as 10 out of 11 are in the green. College campuses are cracking down on COVID by, yes, testing the sewage systems. University president uh, from Arizona will be here to explain this unorthodox approach and why he thinks it is working as an early telltale of COVID. More Power Lunch up next. The Bond Report is brought to you by PIMCO, a global leader in active fixed income.
Mr. Wonderful here. It's hard for everyday people to get access to startup investments. But with Start Engine, you can choose between hundreds of startups to build your portfolio. It's your turn to become a shark. Visit startengine.com today. Right now, you have to think about the pandemic in the context of every story and every stock. Over 25% of the S&P 500 is tech. Tech has been carrying the market. Tech was made for this moment. The stock market has already factored in so much good news. Now it's time to see if it lives up to the hype. We talk to the most influential investors at the most important time. This is a financial crisis, an economic crisis, and a health crisis all wrapped into one. At CNBC, we deliver the market insight you really can't get anywhere else. Some companies still have HR stuck between employees and their data. Entering data, changing data, more and more sensitive personal data. And it doesn't just drag HR down, it drags the entire business down with inefficiency, errors, and waste. It's ridiculous. So ridiculous. With Paycom, employees enter and manage their own data in a single, easy-to-use software. Visit Paycom.com and schedule your demo today. My reputation was trashed online. I felt completely helpless. My entire career and business were in jeopardy. I called Reputation Defender. Take control of your online reputation. Get your free reputation report card at reputationdefender.com. Find out your online reputation today and let the experts help you repair it. They were able to restore my good name. Visit reputationdefender.com or call 1-877-866-8555. Welcome back. Colleges around the country are seeing coronavirus cases spike on campus. It's forcing many to rethink their plans for the fall semester. But one university's bold strategy could be a game changer in stopping the spread. The University of Arizona is testing dorms wastewater as an early warning system to catch cases of COVID-19. Experts say the test is sensitive enough to detect the virus a week before people develop symptoms. Joining us now is the president of the University of Arizona, Dr. Robert Robbins. It's great to have you here. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate you uh, making time for me. And listen, I mean, we, we all kind of chuckle because it's kind of an immature topic. It's why I so greatly appreciate you joining us to talk about it, because this could be a huge breakthrough. Tell me how you guys realized that looking at wastewater was going to tip you off uh, to COVID early, and if you think that this is something that everyone could do. Yeah, I, I do think it's going to catch on uh, across all sectors, but... Uh, we, the University of Arizona for the last two years has been ranked as the number one globally ranked water program in the world. And we have a big water center here. And Dr. Ian Pepper uh, has been at this work uh, going back even 20 years to testing polio and other uh, pathogens in wastewater. So when we ask him, uh, could we use this in our dormitories and the buildings on campus, uh, he got to work over the summer, and uh, we've been utilizing it uh, since our students came back to campus a couple of weeks ago. So tell me how it works, because I imagine most wastewater is collected from a number of different places at a time. Um, do you kind of use it to say, okay, this particular area might have a case, and now we can go do the swab test or something like that? Yeah, that's exactly what we've been doing last week. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Pepper isolates the... Uh, the pipes that come out of each individual dorm and, and simply does tests. He, he gets PCR testing of that uh, wastewater uh, and then looks at the data and then alerts us when there's a positive hit, uh, a hot spot in one of our dorms. And then we go in and test uh, all the students because it's a great way, it's sensitive, as you said in your uh, preamble, uh, to find out that the building has... Uh, a positive case in it, but it's the proverbial uh, needle in a haystack. We then have to go in and test all the students there. And uh, the first dorm had about 300 students in it and three positives. Yesterday, we had four uh, dorms and 32 positives out of 600 tests. Overall, we've had over 14,000 tests we've done with 344 positives. So about a 2.3% uh, rate of infection. 
So I, I love the uh, ingenuity behind this approach, and I love even more that the individual behind it is Dr. Pepper. I think that is just wonderful. But let, so let me ask misunderstood. You, yeah. So so let's talk about what you, you you've just outlined what you've been finding and the idea that you're isolating it from dorm to dorm or building to building to see where the thing might happen. When you find a positive test in an individual, what happens to those individuals and to the others with whom they may have had contact? Yeah, so we have a, uh, a test, trace, and treat program. So when we find the positive case, they, uh, then our team goes in and does contract, contact tracing, meaning finding out who that individual has been around in the last few days. Uh, they are then moved to an isolation dorm and isolated out of the general population uh, for 10 days. Uh, the beauty of this test is we can find asymptomatic cases, and that's what we're really after. Find those unsuspecting vectors that are spreading this disease, and they have no idea that they're, they have the disease. So uh, positive cases are then isolated in an isolation dorm, and we have wraparound services to provide them Wi-Fi so they can take their glasses remotely, food services, and uh, they get uh, telehealth check-in from, from our health care providers and mental health counseling because, as you can imagine, your, your whole world of uh, starting your college uh, year out in the, mm. in the fall semester is interrupted because you have to go isolate. Yeah, it's a, and you know, you're starting out, like you said, already in kind of an isolated situation, you know, moving away, uh, presumably somewhere, and, and now this barely made any friends. Uh, so I can understand that. I, my final question is what's the cost and the difficulty of doing this kind of test? Is it something that could be widely accessible? Yeah, I think uh, Ian Pepper uh, has said that the reagents to do the test is about $150 a test. Uh, it's a standard. Uh, PCR test. Um, obviously, you, you have to go out and manually take off a manhole cover and uh, and then use sort of like a, a net that you uh, clean your pool with and drop it down into the sewage line. And there's a bottle that collects the, the wastewater and then he takes it back to the lab and does a PCR test in a few hours can tell us if there's a hot spot. So it gives us a a great reference to go and systematically look at our dorms when they're hot spots. You know, it's just fascinating. You know, talk about dirty jobs, but again, yes, right. when you're in Arizona, of course you have, you know, the premier water research facility in the nation. The fact you could apply that to finding COVID in wastewater is, is a great breakthrough. Dr. Robert Robbins, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Tyler, that story had it all. Yeah, no, that is that's fascinating stuff. It, it really is, is amazing. He's a medical doctor also, by the way. Uh, we've got some breaking news out of Washington. Uh, let's get to Elon Moy for the details. Hi, Elon. Tyler, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office is projecting the federal deficit will hit $3.3 trillion this year. That is more than three times the size of the deficit last year, and of course, in large part due to the coronavirus relief packages. That number also represents about 16% of GDP, and that would be the highest percentage since 1945. In addition, the CBO also says that the size of the federal debt will nearly equal the size of the economy this year. By 2023, the debt will equal 107% of GDP, and that is a record level. However, when you look out over the next decade, the CBO's forecast for the deficit is actually lower than it was in March. And that is because even though revenues are down and spending is up, their estimates for interest rates and for inflation are lower than anticipated through 2030. Guys, back to you. All right, Elon, fascinating there that they think that the uh, debt total debt and deficit will come down for those two reasons. Elon, thank you very much. Still ahead, Wingstop has been flying high despite the challenges of the pandemic, and the fast casual chain has managed to keep pace with pizza delivery companies for one key reason. And we'll learn it when the CEO joins us next. Plus, Tesla down more than 10% in the past two days. What? That's right, 10% after what's been an epic run for the stock. We will tell you what's weighing on the shares right after the break. More power to you in a moment. When the world gets complicated, a lot goes through your mind. With Fidelity Wealth Management, your dedicated advisor can give you straightforward advice and tailored recommendations. That's the clarity you get with Fidelity Wealth Management.
hey, did you? Yep, done. And the? Of course. And? Oh, yeah. All in one hour. Behind the world's most productive people is the world's most comfortable chair, the incredible X chair, featuring patented dynamic variable lumbar support. X chair's adjustable seat depth keeps users small to tall, comfortable, and supported. Available in breathable mesh, HDR foam, or top grain leather. Customize comfortable positions for your neck and arms. And X chair's patented side float infinite recline provides the perfect recline for users of almost any size. This is not your grandfather's office chair. X chair supports workers everywhere who find themselves now working from home. Call or click to get $100 off the amazing X chair featuring dynamic variable lumbar support. Plus, for a limited time, you can also get free same-day shipping. This deal is good for any X chair you choose. Create the world's most comfortable home office with X chair. Call or click to order today and receive a 30-day risk-free trial and $100 off. When the world gets complicated, a lot goes through your mind. With Fidelity Wealth Management, your dedicated advisor can give you straightforward advice and tailored recommendations. That's the clarity you get with Fidelity Wealth Management. When the nation is on the move, Main Street's new view of the market. It is an IPO palooza. Where COVID hotspots are improving on the path forward. Stay connected, stay informed. Watch or listen live on the CNBC app. We talked a little earlier about the Momo slowdown, Momo losing its mojo, Tesla the number one name in that group, falling now for the second straight day, and Phil LeBeau joins us with more. Phil. Hey, Tyler, I wouldn't call this a sell-off, but it's definitely a pullback in shares of Tesla. In fact, if you take a look at the stock, you'll see that it is down basically about 12% since touching $500 a share. Uh, and that was yesterday. That was its all-time high. I think it was $501 today. Its largest outside investor, Bailey Gifford, which is out of uh, the U.K., it announced that it is pairing its holding of Tesla, not because they don't have faith in the company or they think it's time to cash out. They basically have said, look, our stake is going to fall below 5%. We've got to adjust our portfolio because of the way that they have their funds set up, that they don't want to have an over-concentration in just one security. They, as a result, have said, we're going to pull back on uh, our stake in Tesla. However, they're still very bullish on Tesla, issuing a statement saying, we intend to remain significant shareholders for many years ahead. We remain very optimistic about the future of the company. Tesla's market cap remains well over $400 billion. Where is it at now? $442 billion, $412 billion. Put this into perspective. That's basically equal to the top five automakers in the world combined. And then when you look at the sales, Tesla sold 367,000 vehicles last year, guys. The top five automakers sold about 44 million. Those numbers uh, are mind-boggling. Phil, thank you. Let's go to Seema Modi for Trading Nation. Tyler, we are watching the U.S. dollar. It is down 10% since March, lowest level against the euro in over two years. The question is, what does it mean for stocks? Well, the companies that benefit the most are the ones that generate a large percentage of their revenue outside the U.S. Top of the list, materials, technology, and consumer staples. Though a weaker dollar does make imports more expensive, so the winners aren't as clear-cut as you may think. Let's bring in the panel to discuss. Chad Morganlander of Washington Crossing Advisors. And by phone, J.C. O'Hare of MKM Partners. J.C., you've been digging through the names that have successfully diversified their business over the past couple of years. Which names or sectors uh, stand out to you? Well, as you said, the U.S. dollar has really weakened recently. And, you know, we found when we're in a weak dollar regime, you know, our work suggests, as you mentioned, you want to be overweight materials, you want to be overweight technology and, and even healthcare. But when you get down to the individual stocks, you want to find those companies who derive a good portion of revenue from overseas. And we brought along a chart just to depict what we found. Off the March low, we could see a basket of S&P 500 stocks with above average revenue from international markets outperformed. That basket returned 61%. Now that compared to the S&P, which over that same time period was up 53%. Now, if we include those stocks, which have a small portion of international revenue, that basket is higher by just 40%. So the moral of the story is you want to go hunting in a weak dollar environment for those companies uh, that have good uh, foreign earnings. Yeah, and Chad, you've been sort of looking at names within the industrial space, warming up to names like 3M and Honeywell. Why do you think these industrial giants can outperform in a weaker dollar environment? 
So there's uh, several reasons. One is because you get a you get a positive tailwind in regard to bringing back U.S. Uh, bring back currency to the United States. So we think that the revenue growth over the next three to five years will get a, b a modest bump. Secondarily, uh, because of the weak dollar environment, these industrials uh, have, from a valuation perspective, been, tr been trading quite cheaply. And as you start to go past 2021 into 2022, we believe that the industrials' valuations will go up considerably. So not only look at Honeywell, Look at General Dynamics and Raytheon Technologies. We believe for investors that have a two to three year time horizon, you could do quite well and also benefit from this weak dollar environment. Got it. Some names in industrials and defense. Uh, Chad and JC, thanks for joining us today. For more Trading Nation, head to our website or follow us on Twitter. Kelly, over to you. All right, Seema, thank you very much. Still ahead on Power Lunch, we're hitting the skies. Wingstop flying high this year. The company's CEO joins us to explain how delivery is dominating the competition. Plus a big call on the airlines, Berenberg downgrading American and Delta, but getting bullish on Southwest, which is in the green today. All this when Power Lunch returns. And now, the latest from TradingNation.CNBC.com and a word from our sponsor. Overbought and oversold indicators are generally used differently depending on whether the stock is range-bound or trending. Look to buy a range-bound market when an oscillator, such as the RSI, falls into oversold territory and then moves back above it. Look to sell a range-bound market when the oscillator rises into overbought territory and then drops below it. I'm Lee Bull, and Schwab is the better place for traders. Okay. Bounce the trade idea off my firm. Same old lines. I mean, show me some technical indicators, proprietary research, something. That's why I like Schwab. They help look out for your blind spots. Come on, Johnny. You got this, buddy. Speaking of blind spots... It's time to trade up. Schwab helps you see the full picture with powerful intel and trading specialists who get it. Plus, get commission-free online stock, ETF, and options trades. Schwab, the better place for traders. Uh, Knights go K-5, you are clear for land. Roger. Roger that. Night Scope K5 reporting for duty. To learn more and schedule a demo, please visit us at www.nightscope.com. Before money, people traded goods, tools, cattle, grain, even shells represented value. Then currency came along. They made it out of copper, gold, silver, wampum. Soon people decided to put all that value into a piece of paper, then proceeded to wave goodbye to value, printing unlimited amounts of money as they pass the buck to the future. That's why it's time for digital currency and your investment in the Grayscale funds. Go digital. Go Grayscale. 30 players all fighting to become a champion, but only one can win the ultimate prize. History will be made here at the Tour Championship, Sunday on NBC. What can you expect from ButcherBox? 100% grass-fed beef, organic free-range chicken, heritage breed pork, and so much more. From farmers who believe in raising animals with care, with no antibiotics or added hormones, ever. All with free shipping right to your door. Together, we can make a difference, one meal at a time. Visit ButcherBox.com to learn more. This is cellulose acetate, a plant-based material that's not only extremely durable, but also quite flexible, making it ideal for Warby Parker glasses, which, by the way, start at $95, including prescription lenses. Try five pairs for free at WarbyParker.com. Oh, yeah, about those prescription lenses. Warby Parker glasses come standard with custom-cut polycarbonate lenses that have been treated with scratch-resistant and anti-reflective coatings. Nice. Try five pairs for free at WarbyParker.com.
Welcome back, everybody. I'm Sue Herrera. Here's your CNBC News update at this hour. Joe Biden laying out his plan for getting kids back to school and improving child care. He is also criticizing President Trump, saying the White House has no real plan to help schools reopen. Mr. President, where are you? Where are you? Why aren't you working on this? We need emergency support funding for our schools, and we need it now. So, President, that's your job. A new poll shows Biden leading Trump by just four percentage points in the key state of Pennsylvania. The Monmouth University poll indicates the gap is closing due to a shift in support among men and voters under the age of 50. And take a look at that. Forget wild goose chases, that's a wild boar. And it led Japanese police on a five-hour chase through fields and along streets. After efforts to capture the animal alive failed, unfortunately, hunters were called in to shoot and kill it. I'm not sure oh, you were no. going to get anywhere with that net with a wild boar. They couldn't put it in a zoo because they tend to be aggressive, so. Yeah, no, they are, they're, uh, they're a handful, as that would clearly indicate. As that indicate. one would show you. All right, well, Sue, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a look at the markets right now, shall we? And uh, there's a pretty picture of green on the screen. 306 points higher, 1% for the industrials. The uh, S&P also more than 1% higher. NASDAQ uh, has r rallied yet again. It was uh, flat to negative briefly there earlier today, now up almost 85 points. Oil closing for the day. It is down 3%. Kelly. All right, Tyler, thanks. This pandemic is creating a new reality for restaurants. Some are struggling and others are thriving. Take Wingstop, lower today but soaring more than 80% this year and reporting a 32% increase. 32% increase in same-store sales in the second quarter. The fast casual chain has focused significantly on delivery. It even signed an exclusive contract with DoorDash back in 2018. For more, let's bring in our own Kate Rogers, who is with the CEO and president of Wingstop, Charlie Morrison. Kate. Kelly, thanks so much. And Charlie, thank you for joining us today. Great to be here. Thank you. Well, Kelly just mentioned that really impressive same-store sales performance in the most recent quarter. The company's planning on opening up new locations. You've seen momentum continue, even as dining rooms for other restaurants have begun to open around the country. What does that tell you about the new consumer and the new environment that you're operating in? Well, I think uh, it's clear to all of us, and I know it was mentioned earlier, that uh, brands that are leaning into digital uh, or have been over a period of time are the ones that have succeeded uh, through this difficult time we've all faced. And we were there as well. Uh, we started our efforts to digitize every transaction a few years ago, building the infrastructure necessary to do that in a seamless way. And I think you're seeing consumers uh, be very comfortable and trusting of brands that have done this. And I think at Wingstop, you know, we also have a wonderful craveable food uh, that people enjoy, which is chicken wings. And uh, that gives them a little bit of added comfort. They trust our brand. They trust the solution that we've provided to them during this time. You've also been hiring like many other players in the space that have also performed well during the pandemic. Wingstop has brought on, I believe, about 6,000 domestic new employees. Are you and your franchisees looking to hire more in the future as demand continues to increase? And did enhanced unemployment benefits give you any challenges during that hiring time? Yeah, we, we made sure to take care of all of our team members, not only our corporate team members for the restaurants we run, but also our franchisees who we call our brand partners, uh, did an excellent job of making sure they rewarded our team for being on the front line during a difficult time and being available to help uh, our guests uh, have a safe and clean environment where they could get their food. Uh, as we look forward, uh, certainly we have hired a lot of people during this time frame. We anticipate continuing to hire not only uh, just to service the demand we're seeing now, but our franchisees are doing a fantastic job of reigniting growth in new restaurants. During the last quarter, we opened 23 net new restaurants when many concepts weren't opening any. In fact, un unfortunately, going the other direction. We see that trend continuing well into this year and next year. And every new restaurant we add is about 25 or more new jobs in the market. So definitely, we expect to continue to hire uh, for here and into the future. Charlie, it's Kelly here. As other people have figured out that this is a winning formula, I also think about Chipotle adding all of its Chipotle lanes as they realize that it's going to be drive through in the future. Taco Bell, same thing. Its new restaurants are going to be primarily drive through So, you know, you have the advantage right now, but what happens as the delivery and drive through space becomes more crowded? 
Well, our business has been an off-premise business since the inception. In fact, even prior to the pandemic, we enjoyed 75 or 80% of our sales coming as off-premise occasions, so very little dine-in. Our restaurants are located typically in strip centers in the inline side of the space, so drive throughs aren't an option, but really the key for us is delivery. Uh, we've more than doubled our delivery business since we started, or since the pandemic started, and uh, we have a great partnership with DoorDash. Uh, the integration is seamless for not only uh, our customers, but also for our team members to make it a very efficient occasion. And we're gonna stick to that playbook. We believe it's what's fueling growth and what will continue to fuel growth into the future. Charlie, quick last question here. You've got two new entrants into the wing space, which is of course your primary focus. Domino's has new and enhanced wings. Brinker has its digital wings only business that's doing really well. Thoughts on the competition and do you think you can take them on? Well, we've always believed we're in a category all by ourselves. Nobody really does what we do. We are the wing experts. We always have been. And I think our 25 years of history, our continued success and our growth right now demonstrates that we're not worried about a particular competitor coming into the space or another concept upgrading uh, their, their uh, flavors and, and their product. For us, we're gonna continue to play offense. We're gonna continue to grow what we believe is the best brand out in the space and one that exists in a category all by itself. All right. Thank you both Charlie Morrison of Wingstop and our own Kate Rogers here to tell us about the incredible year that they've had. We appreciate it. Tyler? All right, throughout the day on CNBC, we have been watching the rise in price of things you use every single day. Let's take a look at luncheon meat. What's better than, than luncheon meat to talk about here on Power Lunch? It is up 8.1% in the four weeks ending August 22nd compared with the same period last year. Where's the beef? There's the beef. Coming up, on power movers, booze, bikes, and teeth. There's a connection there. Plus, the NFL season kicks off next week. Two big questions remain. Will fans be in the stands? Will players kneel? We will hear what Commissioner Roger Goodell had to say earlier today to CNBC. That's next on Power Lunch. KPMG asks, what are you shooting for? Celebrating the next generation of women leaders. KPMG, proud sponsor of the KPMG Women's PGA Championship. Silver American Eagles have become some of the most desirable coins for investors looking to acquire precious metals. Investors who acquire this coin do so for the value and diversification that silver brings to an investment portfolio. And now, with help from Monix, you can begin investing in Silver American Eagles. Monix has account representatives standing by who will answer your question about investing in Silver American Eagles and any other silver coin available from Monix. Call Monix now or visit our website where you will see all of our silver products available for investors like you along with live up-to-the-minute prices. Call right now and discover how simple it can be to have your pure, high-quality Silver American Eagles delivered to you or stored for you in an independent third-party vault. Call, learn, and invest with Monex, one of America's trusted names in precious metals for more than 50 years. Mr. Wonderful here. It's hard for everyday people to get access to startup investments. But with Start Engine, you can choose between hundreds of startups to build your portfolio. It's your turn to become a shark. Visit startengine.com today. Hey, I'm Zach, CEO of Roman. Some health issues are tough to talk about. With Roman, you can go online, chat with a physician, and if treatment is right for you, we'll ship genuine medication right to your door. Let's take care of it. The nation's jobs picture. Did the resurgence of the virus catch up with the resurgent job market? Or did business reopenings put more Americans back to work? August numbers, Friday on Squawk Box. And now, watch Squawk Box anytime on demand. Welcome back. Time for today's Power Movers, and we start with Peloton higher again. So it's not selling off with the other momentum names. JP Morgan raised its price target on the stock to $105 a share. That is the highest on the street. Analysts say the company's biggest challenge is keeping up with demand. 
It's a pretty good problem to have. Peloton up uh, to about $90 a share today. Smile Direct is up nearly 25% after several executives, including the CEO, buying a combined 2 million shares in the company. And Brown Foreman is up 10%. This is a company behind Jack Daniels and a bunch of other alcohol brands. Had earnings they were better than expected despite COVID-related challenges, including to its travel-related retail sales. It had strength in ready-to-drink beverages, including pre-packaged Jack and Coke, news to me, Ty, uh, and whiskey and lemonade. So some product innovation there. Very interesting. All right, thank you, Kelly. The first week of football season, NFL, that is, is just eight days away, a week from tomorrow night. And not only is the NFL going to play, they are planning to have fans in person at several stadiums. Commissioner Roger Goodell was on CNBC earlier today, and Eric Chemi joins us now with more on how they plan to pull this off, Eric. Tyler, that's right. Roger Goodell telling CNBC that health and safety remains the league's key focus right now, but he is hoping more stadiums will begin allowing fans as the season progresses. For now, only a handful of teams will have spectators in the first weekend. Goodell says that decision is up to local government officials. The imbalance has upset many coaches who say that's unfair. It's helping only some teams. But the commissioner said the league doesn't believe live fans give a competitive advantage, if you can believe that. Goodell also addressed social justice issues, saying the league welcomes Colin Kaepernick back to the table to join the conversation. The commissioner also said he is listening to players as the league has announced several new initiatives. We respect our players, and uh, they, they have done a great job of bringing attention to these issues. Our focus now is how do we support them in making the changes, um, and that's, that's where we're focusing. I, I, there, there are a lot of things that we're planning for this season that are, creates uncertainty, and we're prepared you know, to make the best decisions on behalf of the NFL and behalf of our players and behalf of our fans and our partners. The first game kicks off next Thursday with a limited number of fans in Kansas City. Guys, back to you. Did he discuss the idea of playing games in a so-called bubble like the NBA has done very successfully versus the idea of not playing in a bubble, which has resulted in, for example, Major League Baseball having to cancel a lot of games? And if you cancel games in the NFL, it's hard to make them up. Yeah, so the bubble idea, when I've talked to league officials going back several months into the summer, the bubble idea just wasn't on the table. Because remember, these games basically are all played at the same time on Sunday. So there's really no place in the world where you've got 10 football fields of professional quality all in the same place. So the bubble idea, not really going to happen. And the schedule has been built in with some, with some levers, if you may. If there are teams that miss games, they have a way of making it up, or they might just go off of win percentage. Hey, you, you played 10 games that's good enough we'll see you in the playoffs all right eric thanks eric chemi kelly coming up a company teaming up with cities and states to get people tested for coronavirus the very latest next on power lunch It's a familiar story. Allergies ruining your sleep and next day too. Taking Zizol at night relieves allergies while you sleep, so you wake refreshed. Plus, it works faster than Claritin and on first dose provides the same relief as Zyrtec at nearly half the size. Be wise all. Take Zizol at night. Before money, people traded goods, tools, cattle, grain, even shells represented value. Then currency came along. They made it out of copper, gold, silver, wampum. Soon people decided to put all that value into a piece of paper, then proceeded to wave goodbye to value, printing unlimited amounts of money as they passed the buck to the future. That's why it's time for digital currency and your investment in the Grayscale funds. Go digital. Go Grayscale. Thanks. Buy a truck high-tech military aircraft. It's an all-new top 10 as Jay counts down his top 10 military and service vehicles. Jay Leno's Garage, all new tonight at 10 Eastern. CNBC, get yours. This is cellulose acetate, a plant-based material that's not only extremely durable, but also quite flexible, making it ideal for Warby Parker glasses, which, by the way, start at $95, including prescription lenses. Try five pairs for free at warbyparker.com. Oh, yeah, about those prescription lenses. Warby Parker glasses come standard with custom-cut polycarbonate lenses that have been treated with scratch-resistant and anti-reflective coatings. Nice. Try five pairs for free at warbyparker.com.
We are KiwiCo, and we deliver hands-on STEM projects designed to inspire young innovators. Kids of all ages can explore science, engineering, art, and more. Get 30% off. Visit trykiwico.com. Must be 18 or older to log on. Just always thought dog food is dog food. Didn't really piece together that dogs eat food. As soon as we brought the farmer's dog in, her skin was better. She was more active. If I can invest in her health and be proactive, I think it's worth it. Visit betterforthem.com. The U.S. economy undergoing a major shift right now due to the pandemic. Companies have had shift their business models. One example is a company called Solve, which used to coordinate urgent care and doctor's appointments. Now it's setting people up with COVID tests, and it just signed a major deal with the state of Michigan. Julia Borson has those details. Julia? That's right, Kelly. Today, Solve, which has already managed over 1.3 million COVID and antibody tests nationwide, announcing it's partnering with the state of Michigan to enable people to find and book free COVID testing. Now, at a dozen, that, this will start at a dozen neighborhood testing sites this week, locations including churches and community colleges, with the potential for more than 330 testing sites to use this Solve platform for COVID testing in coming months. Solve is aiming to not only help people find tests, but also make the testing locations themselves more efficient. Part of what the technology does is actually enable you to take high volumes of people who are looking for access right now, get them to the right place, and then once they get there, effectively commingle both those who have booked online as well as walked in in a way that matches the throughput of the facility. It's actually quite challenging to do. This builds on the success that Solve has had offering free testing in partnership with the city of Seattle. Fernandez tells us that they're helping Seattle now do 2,800 tests a day and that they're also in talks with other states about similar partnerships. Solve has raised over $23 million from VCs, including Bill Gurley's Benchmark and Reed Hoffman's Greylock, fueling its expansion to telehealth as well as to COVID tests. Tyler, back over to you. All right, thank you very much, Julia. Airlines have been a hot momentum play since the March lows. The index up 80% since then. But have investors gotten ahead of themselves counting on news that may not come? We'll talk about that next. And don't forget, you can always watch or listen to us live on the go on the app. We'll be right back. are saying yes to Allegra, including the experts. It's the number one allergist recommended brand for non-drowsy relief. Allegra works two times faster than Claritin. And while Zyrtec may cause drowsiness, Allegra won't. Say yes to Allegra. At Southern New Hampshire University, we're committed to making college more affordable. That's why we're keeping our tuition the same through the year 2021. I knew SNHU was the place for me when I saw how affordable it was. Find your degree at snhu.edu. When the world gets complicated, a lot goes through your mind. How long will this last? Am I prepared for this? Are we prepared for this? With Fidelity Wealth Management, your dedicated advisor can give you straightforward advice and tailored recommendations. With access to tax-smart investment strategies designed to help you keep more of what you've earned. So you'll know you're doing what you can for your family and your future. That's the clarity you get with Fidelity Wealth Management. Tonight's go K-5, you are clear for land. Roger. Roger that. Tonight's go K-5, reporting for duty. To learn more and schedule a demo, please visit us at www.nightscope.com. United Airlines says it will involuntarily furlough more than 16,000 employees on October 1 when federal airline aid 
is set to run out. Among them, pilots, flight attendants, airport operations staff, maintenance, worker, maintenance workers. They can be recalled if demand returns and if they don't have another job by then. But our next guest isn't seeing many bright spots ahead for airlines. Berenberg's Adrian Janoshik is upgrading Southwest to buy. But even that, he says, is the least leaky of airline equity buckets. As for the others, he says, sell American Airlines, and he puts holds on both Delta and United. With more on his calls is Adrian Janoshik. I hope I got your last name correctly, Adrian. Uh, correct me if I didn't. I beg your pardon. Um, Perfect. Good. Hey, wow. First time ever. All right, let's talk about uh, some of these companies here. And you like uh, Southwest the most, but one of your hypotheses is that the business traveler, uh, which may or may not be a big part of uh, Southwest constituents, is not going to come, come back anytime fast, and I don't see that either. Yeah, that's just it. Uh, I think we have to uh, kind of accept reality that, uh, you know, as far as you peel back um, the start of improving demand on the corporate side, we're just we're just not seeing it. You can go to uh, travel agency bookings, you talk to travel managers, travel manager surveys, uh, even just going to simple office occupancy rates. Uh, it's a real, that's what you need to have that part of demand start, we're just not seeing it quite yet. And we've learned, if we've learned anything, that an awful lot of the meetings we used to have where we would travel, for example, from the East Coast to the West Coast for two one-hour meetings on a Tuesday and back that night or back the next morning, those things aren't going to happen that way, I don't think, quite as much as they used to. They're going to happen this way with you on the other side of a Zoom or a, a WebEx or whatever, right? Uh, certainly for a period of time. I mean, let's, uh, let's even look at, you know, ignoring the business passenger um, on the leisure side, uh, which, is, which has improved a little bit recently. Um, it's, it's sort of stalled there as well. And I think, you know, it always, uh, as much as you try to look through the different trends, it comes down to are, are people feeling safe getting on the aircrafts? And at this uh, particular juncture, uh, the industry is doing everything it can to add to that level of, of comfort and uh, confidence. Um, but until you've got, you know, vaccine and therapeutics combination thereof, it, it's sort of anybody's guess as to where the demand uh, levels off, uh, you know, relative to last year's levels. Um, the debate is, is it half? Is that where things are going to without uh, a solution on the health front? Um, it, it, it's somewhat of an academic debate, but uh, that's where we are. Adrian, I'm curious about the impact of United's announcement this week that it's no longer going to charge you to change your flight. So no more change fee, uh, fees, which is something that you, Southwest has been doing for a while. Um, but on the day of that announcement, all the airline shares sold off, Southwest included. Uh, do you think that was because of the announcement? Is it going to be a profitability headwind for everybody, or is it good in the long run? Well, certainly in the short run, it just doesn't matter. I mean, al almost anybody can book on any airline right now uh, and change for, for free. Uh, it, it is a step, uh, and I think there's a little bit of a debate as to, as to who wins and who loses right now. Uh, I am of the view that it effectively kind of pulls all of the product levels up to where South was, Southwest was as a starting point. So, uh, you know, they were differentiated there. Uh, now sort of United, Delta, and all the other legacies and, and non-legacies is kind of moving in that direction. And now basic economy uh, gets differentiated. So uh, I think in the long run, it's going to be um, good for Southwest, uh, but it's going to take uh, some months uh, before you start to see that. So, so, so pinpoint it for me. Why is Southwest your standout here? Is it because basic economy, their sweet spot is going to be the dominant category of travel or what? Yeah, it's, well, it's a little bit uh, even more simple than that. I okay. mean, I think it, if you look at uh, across the bigger, uh, the legacy carriers, the burden that uh, your very high debt loads are going to bring is going to be a drag for, uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and that's just on the kind of non-operating cost side. But you've also got uh, Southwest, which has a, a slightly lower cost structure, um, which does allow it to compete, as you say, against those carriers. And then I think with the introduction of the 737 MAX next year, uh, the economics of the aircraft type, 
despite the challenges uh, from a technical and customer perception issue, uh, do offer it the ability to start generating cash flow a little bit quicker than, right. uh, than its peers. So I think that's really it. This is a game about generating cash flow uh, and repairing those balance sheets as quickly I'm as you curious. can. I'm curious. You're an airline analyst. Have you been on a plane lately? When was the last time? It has been a long time, since early March, yep. all over the U.S., taking uh, all sorts of carriers. And um, I'm not sure it's going to be this year to go out and see investors. I, uh, I feel the same way, Adrian. Thanks very much. Adrian Yanoshek, we appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. Thanks, all. Well, Kelly, the market uh, is inexorable here. Just keeps moving up but, and up and up, just to use a fancy word. No, but that's the right word to use today, because you know what it doesn't have. It doesn't have Apple. It doesn't have Tesla. It doesn't have some of the other momentum names. So you have Zoom down, you have Salesforce down, but even Workday, DocuSign, Ty. So when you look at the major averages and see that not just the NASDAQ is higher, uh, or I should say not just the Dow and the S&P, but the NASDAQ is even marching higher, it's like the wise Michael Santoli said last hour. I mean, it, it's a good sign if this can be the case, even without the participation from some of the biggest Momo names in the market. Yeah, that's right. If the sexy stocks aren't even taking place, uh, then, then you're looking elsewhere. You're looking maybe at the Procter and Gamble's that are at, at all-time highs, the Nike's that are at all-time highs, uh, some of the others that you, that we can point to, that uh, some some in the healthcare, the healthcare sector at an all-time high. A lot of those uh, those stocks uh, just zooming. <laughs> Bingo. Thanks for watching Power Lunch, everybody. Closing bell starts right now. See you tomorrow. It certainly does. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to The Closing Bell. I'm Wilfred Frost, along with Sarah Eisen. Stocks strengthening through the session. The S&P uh, up, uh, what, 1.2%. The Nasdaq underperforms. That's a turnaround that started after the open uh, early this morning. It was the other way around, but either way, all of the indices are higher. Let's have a look at what's driving the action. A bit of a rotation, high-flying tech names like Apple, Tesla, Zoom, giving back some gains, uh, as Tyler and Kelly were just saying, uh, and beating down parts of the market like utilities are rallying. The tech trade uh, that's working is the semis, LAM Research, AMAT, Micron, NVIDIA at the top of the leaderboard right now. And new data points to a sluggish economic recovery as payrolls data disappoints and the Fed's beige book shows a modest increase only in activity. 59 minutes until the close, we're set to have another couple of record highs for the S&P and the Nasdaq, what, up 1.2% on the S&P 500, Sarah. And it's utilities leading the way higher for a change. Coming up on today's show, Galaxy Digital's Mike Novogratz is back to weigh in on this record-setting rally. As the August strength carries over so far into September, we're going to ask where he's putting money to work right now. And we've got an interesting mix of earnings coming your way after the bell, including work-from-home winners like CrowdStrike and Cloudera. Those are hot, hot cloud companies. Apparel company PVH as well. And we're going to talk to PVH CEO Manny Chirico right after those numbers hit. They own Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger. Let's focus in on the big stories we are watching at this hour, though. Mike Santoli tracking the market action, as always. Steve Leisman with the new highlights from the Fed's beige book released last hour. And joining us to talk Tesla and the pullback we're seeing is Craig Irwin from Roth Capital. But Mike, start us off with the market. Every group is higher now except for energy. But you do have utilities and real estate and health care on top for a change. Right, Sarah. So it is a little bit of uh, defensive laggards having a little moment right now, a little mean reversion, uh, some of the big high flyers pulling back. And it is a net positive if those high momentum names can pull back, as they absolutely must, and the overall tape absorbs it. We'll see if that continues. There are some erratic things you can point to under the surface that maybe say it's not necessarily going to last that way. Here's what I wanted to highlight. Guess what? Year-to-date S&P 500 up 10.5%. That's without dividends. You're at over 11.5% uh, total return. Turn. That's a shocker, I think, because you had a minus 34 in the middle of it. Uh, you're doing better than the annual average already at the beginning of September. It still does leave the idea, though, that maybe we're we're due for some kind of, of give back phase. I've been saying that a long time. Guess what? It's been true for a little while now. It just becomes a little more extreme. NASDAQ, uh, the, the sort of more extended example of this, first of all, really incredible, steady uptrend. And what's kind of fun is if you just sort of extended out what was happening before the crash, it's kind of parallel Lines. This is the track that we've been following. Just got interrupted and derailed briefly back there. Uh, I also would say that you're looking at something around a 6% pullback if all this index does is pull back to the same sort of line that it's been tracking for a while. So in other words, still staying in the uptrend, you've got a quick seven, 6 or 7% off the top is what it would take right now just to revisit that same old line we did four or five times since May. 
Different story with the equal weighted S&P. Clearly, it's been a mega cap uh, leadership story. It's been struggling higher. It's been moving in the right direction. Still not quite to those June 8th highs, though, which is the maximum enthusiasm about the reopening. So it shows it's still not a fully democratic, all-inclusive rally, still intact, uh, probably still with the mega caps and some of the momentum names, a little vulnerable in the short term, guys. Is the economic data still coming in much better than expected to justify these kind of gains in the market and in the outlook? ADP today, private sector jobs, was a huge miss. I know it's not necessarily correlated with the August jobs report. We'll get it on Friday. We'll get claims tomorrow. But what are you seeing in the data? Does it make sense? Uh, does it make sense? I don't know if it's commensurate with how well the market is done, but in general, the, the notion that the economy is in an early recovery mode, you saw the ISM index and manufacturing did bounce back better than expected. The overall economic surprise index, which shows how uh, much the, the data coming in better than forecast, has pulled back a little bit. So it's not as if it's as, uh, as rich as it was a little while ago. So there's a little bit of uh, maybe shaking up of that relationship, but uh, I don't think we're necessarily trading right Right now on the week-to-week -week numbers as much as we are about the general notion that we have tailwinds here in terms of recovery, in terms of an easy Fed, uh, and also just the, the kind of animal spirits that are animating the growthier parts of the market. Mike, thanks so much. Uh, looking forward to further discussion as we approach uh, the close, a record close it will be for the S&P and the Nasdaq. Uh, the Fed's Beige Book uh, of Economic Conditions released last hour. Steve Leisman has a look at the highlights from that report for us. Hi, Steve. Hey, Will. Uh, yeah, the Fed's Beige Book uh, reporting that economic activity generally increased across most districts, but provided some warning signs for the economy as it continues to struggle with the pandemic. Uh, consumer spending continued to pick up with gains in retail, vehicle sales, and tourism, but many districts reported a slowing pace of growth in these sectors. In addition, uh, residential construction was termed a bright spot for the economy, but commercial construction was widely down. Finally, uh, the overall outlook was modestly optimistic, but with continued uncertainty and volatility related to the pandemic. Unemployment, uh, it increased overall with gains noted in manufacturing, but some districts noted slowing job growth, and there were said to be rising instances of furloughed workers being laid off permanently at the same time. Firms reported difficulty finding workers, stemming in part from the trouble that workers themselves have in finding daycare. Lastly, on inflationary pressures, they increased, but only modestly. There were some price hikes related to supply problems or surges in demand, for example, for lumber. So, uh, Sarah and Wolf, it's an uh, interesting economy. Uh, the market seems to have blinders on that everything is getting better. The Fed Beige Book says things are getting better, but there are some caveats along the way. There certainly are the caveats along the way, Steve, but, but we also got some good PMI data yesterday. So, so sum up what we've learned this week uh, for us. Are, are we net positively surprising or not? <clears throat> yeah, we are positively surprising, though there's uh, quite a bit. It's only Wednesday, Wilf. I don't know if you checked your calendar recently. And well, it's, it's been uh, a little quite long a bit week already. Yet. It feels like it's at least Thursday. <laughs> but, but, but as we near the important data on how Friday. How is tomorrow not Friday? I, I, how is tomorrow not Friday? Not how you feel. But look, some of the high frequency data we're following has been flat. The pace of growth has come off. The ADP number today was not good. Uh, the manufacturing sector is coming back. What I think we're picking up in the manufacturing data is the restarting of some of these factories, Wilf. Um, so uh, I'm not sure we're getting net positive growth from February, but we are getting the pickup and the restarting of these factories, and that's all been very positive, surprising to the upside. Steve, great stuff as always. Thanks so much for that. Uh, shares of Tesla down more than 6% today, slipping from an all-time high. This comes after the company's biggest outside investor reduced its holding. And Tesla announced yesterday that it plans to sell up to $5 billion in new shares. Let's bring in Craig Owen from uh, Roth Capital Partners. He has a neutral rating on the stock and a $150 uh, price target. Uh, Craig, thanks so much for, for joining us. You, you've got a, a, an interesting possible explanation for for the pullback over the last couple of days. It's election related. Yeah, so, so, so over the last six weeks, um, lots of clients have been coming into us uh, for our sustainability coverage, uh, wanting to know which stocks have the most alpha to a Democrat versus Republican win. Um, and there's been a lot of chatter coming through our traders uh, of the same theme. So if you look at the betting averages today, um, it looks like uh, 
we've had 50-50 uh, average met on, on an average of the, the betting sites. And uh, the hedge funds are just assuming that it's, it's going to flip in the favor of a Republican administration. And, and that's causing selling in the sector, uh, people taking off the trade, no longer expecting like a, a Green New Deal or massive uh, subsidies and investment for sustainability related uh, projects and companies. But that assumes that under a Republican administration, it wouldn't be good for Tesla when Tesla's had this monumental rise during the Trump years. So is that correct? I, I agree with you there, but uh, people trade these things for catalysts. You know, personally, I look at this and I say small bridges. Um, the Republican voters out there tend to be the hunters and the fishermen of the of the country, and they tend to love the environment just as much as anyone living in uh, a Democrat stronghold wants uh, clean air and, and, and clean energy for their uh, for their own energy use. So small bridges, you know, I think uh, this is this is a sector that can be embraced by people on all sides of the spectrum, but it, it doesn't impact the, uh, the behavior of short term traders. Um, Craig, neutral rating, but a 150 price target. There, there's uh, there's a, a bit of a gap there. Yeah, so um, Tesla is being valued uh, today, I believe, more as an autonomous company than a car company, right? They're, they're going to have a hard time, they said, making um, the 500,000 units this year, but their valuation is comparable to um, the rest of the automotive industry combined. So, you know, my message to clients is, you know, we love what they're doing. There's definite levers they can pull for accelerating growth, um, and uh, they're going to execute well. But uh, we think there are much better investment opportunities across the sector. You do raise a question, which is what, what's driven the gains in terms of who's been buying Tesla? How much of it do you think is this retail phenomenon versus what you're seeing on the institutional side from hedge funds? So retail is a very large part of the uh, velocity trade in, in Tesla. That's, that's really what's you know, caused you know, very large moves since, uh, since earnings. Um, there are a number of uh, hedge fund trading desks that are piling in and obviously fund managers that, that can't buy the stock in their in their funds have many of them have bought it bought it in their personal uh, accounts because people love the cars if you drive the cars they're great cars um, so it is it is very much a retail trade but there are some some fundamental investors particularly people looking at um, you know seven um, seven thousand dollars for full self-driving in the model three you know, they buy Elon's dream of maybe that being 100,000 one day, you know, robo taxis and things like this. And, um, you know, that is the crowd of investors that we see more active in Tesla as far as institutional investors accumulating shares. Craig Gowen, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Tesla down 6.5% uh, uh, as we speak uh, off its uh, session lows, though. Breaking news on a potential buyout of Kansas City Southern. Eric Chemley's got it for us. Hey, Eric. Uh, hey, Wolf, that's right. So Kansas City Southern, that stock, you can see they're up 5%. Potential buyout is the keyword. Blackstone and Global in Infrastructure Partners submitted a bid to buy the company at a valuation of more than $17 billion. It is not clear, though, if the railroad company will accept that offer. Remember, these guys had previously put in a bid that the railroad company had re buff so this is a new bid valuing the company at more than 17 billion dollars blackstone and gip global infrastructure partners this is according to Dow jones reporting uh you see the stock they're up more than five and a half percent now guys back to you eric chemi eric thank you after the break macy's is the latest brick and mortar retailer to report blowout digital sales we're going to discuss the shift online and how long the old guard can actually ride out this crisis with the former ceo of sears canada you're watching closing bell here on cnbc about to buy her first home and with a verified approval from rocket mortgage she has the strength to compete with cash offers when you need an edge in the bidding war rocket can introducing schwab stock slices for as little as five dollars now anyone can own companies in the s p 500 even if their shares cost more at $5 a slice, you could own 10 companies for $50 instead of paying thousands. All commission-free online. Schwab Stock Slices, an easy way to start investing or to give the gift of stock ownership. Schwab, own your tomorrow. 
When the world gets complicated, a lot goes through your mind. With Fidelity Wealth Management, your dedicated advisor can give you straightforward advice and tailored recommendations. That's the clarity you get with Fidelity Wealth Management. Flex shares may look simple on the outside, but inside every ETF, there are untold hours of careful construction, infinite what-ifs, and contingency plans, creating funds that help target gaps in client portfolios, tap untapped potential, and strengthen confidence in you. FlexShares, powered by over a century of investment expertise. Before investing, consider the fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. Go to FlexShares.com for a prospectus containing this information. Read it carefully. When the nation is on the move, Main Street's new view of the market. This is an IPO palooza. Where COVID hotspots are improving on the path forward. Stay connected, stay informed. Watch or listen live on the CNBC app. You would think a pan is a pan until Made In came along and I went, wow, these things are something better. Those are the pans that we use at Alinea at one of the best restaurants in the world. It's built for a home cook like me, but fit for Alinea like him. Look, you're spending countless hours with spreadsheets trying to organize your finances. You're, you're missing, missing out. out. Stop wasting time. And let Truebill do the work for you. It's the easiest way to save time and money. Download today and take control of your finances. My reputation was trashed online. I felt completely helpless. My entire career and business were in jeopardy. I called Reputation Defender. Take control of your online reputation. Get your free reputation report card at reputationdefender.com. Find out your online reputation today and let the experts help you repair it. They were able to restore my good name. Visit reputationdefender.com or call 1-877-866-8555. Welcome back, Dow up 400 points. Don't call it a data dump. Throughout the day on CNBC, we've been taking a look at the prices of everyday items. Here's a stat that might make some new parents pissed. The price of disposable diapers have pulled up 8.8% in August compared to last year, part of a larger trend in inflation in household goods and groceries. So many peepee -pee jokes there. All right, let's stick with retail. Macy's having a volatile session after this morning's earnings report. The company reported a smaller than expected loss and inventory levels that were down 29% from last year. Digital sales were a bright spot. They grew 53% from a year ago, a trend that's been evident across many retail brands, even some essential names where physical stores remained open. Macy's very much not that case. Joining us now is former Sears CEO, Sears Canada CEO Mark Cohen. He has 25 years of experience in the retail industry and is currently the director of retail studies at Columbia Business School. It's great to have you again, Mark. What is the future of Macy's? It's hard to figure out. Well, they were certainly struggling on the way into this crisis, and I don't see anything about this crisis that suggests they're going to come out in any kind of uh, stronger position. I think the comments that their CEO made uh, today are particularly disingenuous. Uh, he's looking to gain market share from uh, failing luxury players. Uh, he claims Lord & Taylor is a luxury player. Lord & Taylor hasn't been in the luxury business in years. Uh, the Neiman Marcus store closings aren't meaningful enough to make a difference, at least not yet. I think Bloomingdale's has all the brand authority to, uh, to prosper in the luxury space, but uh, outside of a handful of very high-profile locations macy's certainly does not and as far as a uh, new off-mall strategy well i think that's just completely wishful thinking at this point so do, do, do you see any hope for any of the department stores or is that just dead money that category i think the category has been in decline for a very long time i think the pandemic has accelerated that decline i don't think there's anything on the horizon as you look past the pandemic that suggests that these banners, there are very few of them that are left, will have any uh, lasting relevance. Uh, frankly, the Walmart, Target, Costco, Amazon uh, uh, of the world are gobbling up market share, and they've been doing that pre-pandemic. They're certainly uh, uh, taking tremendous advantage, if you will, of the crisis that we're all in. Uh, consumers have been shifting away from these uh, dinosaur-like stores called department stores for a very long time and there's nothing that they're doing today uh, any of them that 
uh, continue to do business that suggests they're going to be highly sought after uh, in the future. When we look at uh, who have been the winners and losers so far in the last three or four months, Mark, which has been a, a bigger key factor? Being uh, ready in terms of uh, e-commerce e and having that uh, uh, very, very well built out or being designated as a, a central retailer? Well, there's no doubt that being a, an essential retailer gives uh, an enterprise an enormous leg up on all those who have been forced to close. Having things that customers eagerly want to buy, groceries, home supplies, home furnishings, certainly is uh, a tremendously valuable in this period that we're living in versus folks like Macy's who are principally focused on apparel and accessories. Uh, so, so being of, able to be in business is an enormous leg up. But coupled with that is the capacity that some of these players have had in building out their credibility in the e-commerce space. Their ability to present and transact to customers eager to uh, procure things that they don't want to have to shop for physically. Uh, credit Amazon for uh, creating this revolutionary channel change. Uh, give Walmart and Target credit, Costco as well, for getting in on this change in a very, very big way. And uh, the investments they've made are paying tremendous dividends at the moment, and they will continue to pay dividends in the future. Because this shift to e-commerce, though it's not going to completely consume brick and mortar, is going to continue to accelerate once this crisis has passed. So, Mark, when you teach your, your course next on the death of department stores, are you going to blame it on management? Because if you look at a company like Macy's, historically, they've had top-tier management. Terry Lundgren, the previous CEO, Karen Hoge, the, the longtime former CFO, beloved by Wall Street during the growth years. It, it's not the current generation, but, but do you see this as preventable with the right management team? Well, Sarah, first off, I don't teach the death of the department store. Uh, the course I'm teaching starting next week is a master class in creating a retail enterprise uh, literally from scratch. And so I'm focused on the future opportunities that retail poses, which are enormous because there are no lack of customers. And on the other side of this crisis, there will be a recovery and a boom, if you will. Uh, I spent 14 years at Federated, uh, which is the predecessor of Macy's. And so forgive me for making a very pointed remark here, but I don't share your optimism or your praise for past management. I think Macy's played out a last man standing strategy for several decades, and now they've run out of gas. They, they have hollowed themselves out. Uh, putting them in a, in a position where in a crisis like this, they have nowhere to go. It's one of the principal reasons why their business was failing before this crisis occurred. Uh, and so, uh, you know, success and failure is always a play on uh, leadership, good, bad, and indifferent. And I don't think uh, Federated then Macy's, now Macy's, has had the benefit of that in contrast to the enormous leadership component that Amazon, Walmart, Target, and Costco represent. What about other department stores, Mark, including Sears, where, where you used to, 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 to be a leader? Um, I mean, it's not like any of the department stores look like they've been brilliantly positioned for the current retail environment. Well, Sears isn't even worth talking about. They, they, they don't have very many stores left, and by this year's end, I suspect they will disappear from view completely. It's anybody's guess whether J.C. Penney will either linger and die or find a lifeline. There's apparently quite a bit of discord among creditors as to what the future will hold. Uh, Lord & Taylor, as you know, has announced its complete liquidation, so they're off the table. Uh, Nordstrom's is starting to reconcile the fact that while their rack business has been growing, and their department store business has seen a tremendous shift of customers from physical shopping to online. I think 30 to 40 percent of their business pre-pandemic was being done online. So they're seeing the, the reality that suggests that they have to consolidate further. Um, anybody's guess what to make of the outcome of the Neiman Marcus bankruptcy, they will invariably shrink back to a smaller number of stores, stores they should have stuck with at the very outset. And then, of course, there's the HBC, Saks, 
enterprise, which I would suggest is at the moment something of a house of cards. So as a channel, the department stores have more or less positioned themselves for their own demise. And uh, the pandemic is, is hastening that outcome. No other way to look at it. Mark, thanks for joining us. You bet. The uh, rally really picking up steam uh, with, what, uh, 37 minutes left of the session. Uh, we're at session highs uh, up uh, over 1% uh, for each of the major indices. In fact, the Nasdaq just shy of that, but uh, close to the level. 1.5% for the Dow. After the break, trouble in the skies. Airline uh, job losses piling up as United announces thousands of upcoming furloughs. We'll fill you in on the latest. The Path Forward is sponsored by Adyen. Business, not boundaries. From tap to pay technology to mobile point of sale, make purchasing easier for your customers with Adyen. And discover a seamless way to let customers pay with touch-free payments. Adyen. Business, not boundaries. Want to stop clogged, smelly drains before they start? You need Sani Sticks from Sani 360, the drain cleaning and sanitizing sticks you simply drop in any drain once a month to prevent backups, clogs, and embarrassing odors. Sani Sticks concentrated enzyme formula repels and prevents the buildup of oils, fats, foods, and soap scum. I just drop in one, and I'm done. Sani Sticks, now available where America's best cleaning products are sold. access to precisely what they want when they need it the most with Adyen, the payments platform that delivers convenience for all. Adyen, business, not boundaries. The nation's jobs picture. Did the resurgence of the virus catch up with the resurgent job market? Or did business reopenings put more Americans back to work? August numbers, Friday on Squawk Box. And now watch Squawk Box anytime on demand. CNBC Make It is now on Peacock. Look what I've accomplished for myself. Every dollar I spend, I think of how I can make to cover it. My default mode is saving. The CNBC Make It channel, streaming free on Peacock. Welcome back. We're at session highs, by the way, 1.5% higher on the S&P and the Dow. Uh, but some more bad news for airline workers today as United announces thousands of upcoming furloughs. Phil LeBeau's got the story for us. Hi, Phil. Hi, Wolf. This was news we expected. We knew that at some point United would say, hey, look, these are the number of jobs that we are going to be telling people you're going to have to be furloughed because people have either taken the allotment of early retirement, voluntary leave. At the end of the day, 16,370 uh, employees will be furloughed. That's the plan starting on October 1st. We're not going to run down all the categories, but the big three that stand out, flight attendants, 6,920, pilots, 2,850, airport operations, 2,200. 260. And here's the reason why. Passenger levels have just not rebounded. And United, along with all the airlines, they're preparing for a slow, very slow recovery as you look out over the next 12 to 18 months. Right now, down 70 to 75 percent. When you take a look at American, Delta, and Southwest, keep in mind that total number of furloughs that have been announced so far, just over 37,000. And that's basically American and then the pilots at Delta. Southwest is trying to get by without having to lay off anyone starting on October 1st. So that's the state of the industry, guys. Expect to hear more of these types of announcements from other airlines over the next couple of weeks. Philip Bo, thanks so much for that. Still ahead, uh, shares of P PVH are down more than 40% uh, over the year, but moving a bit higher today ahead of their earnings report due after the close. We'll get the numbers and uh, follow it with an exclusive interview with CEO Manny Chirico that's coming in just a bit. As we head to break, here's a check on bonds. Mixed action in the Treasury market today. Uh, yields over the last four or five sessions having spiked uh, last Thursday when we got that announcement from the Fed that they're willing to allow inflation to go higher. Uh, much, much lower over the last four or five sessions. 0.65 now on the 10-year.
The Bond Report is brought to you by PIMCO, a global leader in active fixed income. When the world gets complicated, a lot goes through your mind. With Fidelity Wealth Management, your dedicated advisor can give you straightforward advice and tailored recommendations. That's the clarity you get with Fidelity Wealth Management. Introducing new Seneca laxative gummies. I'm the easy way to relieve occasional constipation overnight. Just take before bed and the next morning... It's showtime! And I've got mixed berry flavor. Mm. New Seneca laxative gummies. Easy relief, the gummy way. to leave my class for any reason. What is happening at this school? <laughs> Hi, I'm Yaya, founder of Truebill. These are crazy times, and keeping track of your money has never been more important. With Truebill, you can easily cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and create smart spending habits. Download Truebill today. I'm finally the king of my own castle. But my castle has leaks and ants. So I use Thumbtack to find exterminators, electricians, roofers, and plumbers. Thumbtack has everyone for everything. I can check out reviews, prices, and book the pro I like on the app. So anytime something breaks or leaks or invades my house, I know exactly where to go. It's good to be king. Find your people. Download Thumbtack today. This isn't dry food or wet food. It's not burnt brown pellets. It's real meat and veggies, developed with vets and delivered fresh to you. Visit tryfarmersdog.com and get 50% off your first box of food. Welcome back. Time now for our daily coronavirus tracker. Dr. Anthony Fauci warning today that the U.S. could experience a jump in cases after Labor Day, citing previous surges this summer after Memorial Day, that long weekend, and the 4th of July. This comes as new states are flashing some warning signals. Alabama, for instance, currently has the highest rate of positive tests in the country right now, nearly 33 percent. That state is seeing a rise in cases with more than 1,500 reported just today. South Dakota and Iowa also reporting high positivity rates. Some promising treatment developments today, though. New data showing that an inexpensive class of drugs called corticosteroids reduces the risk of death by one-third in severe coronavirus patients. The WHO issuing new guidelines today based on the data saying the steroids should become the new standard of care for patients with critical COVID-19. So backing up the dexamethasone studies, Wilfred, that we have seen that show improvement here related mm -hmm. to mortality. Absolutely. Uh, time for a CNBC News update. Sue Herrera's got it for us. Hi, Sue. Hello, Wilf. Hello, everybody. Here's what's happening at this hour. We will continue with news on the pandemic. The CDC has told states to prepare for COVID-19 vaccinations as soon as late October or early November. Initial vaccine supplies would go to healthcare workers and other high-risk groups. A Minnesota man is the first reported to have died after COVID, from COVID-19 after attending the Sturgis motorcycle rally in South Dakota last month. Cases among people who attended that rally have been reported in a dozen states. In France, more than 7,000 new cases were reported today, marking only the third day at that level since the pandemic began. And in Italy, former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi has tested positive for the coronavirus. He was recently photographed with the owner of a nightclub, which has been tied to more than 60 infections. You are up to date. That's the news update. The Sarah Sarah, I'll send it back to you. Sue, thank you. We've got just about 27 minutes left before the closing bell. Here's where we stand in the markets. A very strong day again today. Dow, NASDAQ. S&P and Russell, all significantly higher. S&P is rising one and a half percent. It's being led by some of the leaders, the losers lately, like utilities and real estate stocks. Also, healthcare on top. The Dow's up 440 points, so we're building onto into strength here into the close. Up next, Air Jordan's Magic Touch, the NBA legend, 
teaming up with DraftKings, but it's far from his first foray into the business world. We're going to take a closer look at the Jordan effect next. And later, Galaxy Digital's Mike Novogratz weighs in on the market's relentless move higher, tells us where he's putting his money right now. Coming up on Closing Bell. CNBC Sector Sword is sponsored by Sector Spider ETFs. Sector Spider ETFs. Visit us on the web at sectorspiders.com. She only eats wild caught. Uh, I need a price check on honey. <sighs> Don't get mad. Get E-Trade and get more than just trading. Investing, banking, guidance. Municipal bonds don't typically get the media coverage that the stock market does. In fact, some people may even find them boring. What they typically do offer is a stream of income that's federally tax-free. Municipal bonds from Henyon and Walsh can give you income that's tax-free, and you have to admit, tax-free income can be very exciting. At Henyon and Walsh, we offer you tax-free municipal bonds from across the country, so you can benefit from tax-free income wherever you live. There's nothing boring about that. If you have at least $10,000 to invest, we want to send you our exclusive bond guide for free. 1-800-376-4376. That's 1-800-376-4376. We're out to prove that tax-free income can be very exciting indeed. For your free bond guide, call now. 1-800-376-4376. 1-800-376-4376. Mr. Wonderful here. It's hard for everyday people to get access to startup investments. But with Start Engine, you can choose between hundreds of startups to build your portfolio. It's your turn to become a shark. Visit startengine.com today. Now, more than ever, you need a mobile bank account that helps you earn and save more. That is Unlimited by Green Dot. With an incredible 2% interest on your savings and unlimited 2% cash back when you shop online. Open an account at greendot.com. This is such an amazing event. The tradition and the history behind the tournament. ANA Inspiration is like the masters for the ladies' tour. The ANA Inspiration, September 10. DraftKings making a big wager on one of the most celebrated athletes of all time and gamblers. By the way, shares of sports betting company rallying after announcing NBA Hall of Famer Michael Jordan will join the company as a special advisor to its board of directors. As part of the deal, Jordan will receive equity interest in the stock and offer his expertise in areas including sports company strategy, development, diversity. It's far from the first corporate win for the NBA legend. We decided to look back. Jordan, of course, is the majority owner of the Charlotte Hornets, a former executive and part owner of the Washington Wizards, and part owner of the tequila brand, Sincoro. He's also had major endorsements from companies like Nike, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Wheaties, Gatorade. Jordan's superstar power also helping ESPN score big this spring. It's 10-part documentary, The Last Dance, focusing on Jordan's epic run with the Chicago Bulls, averaging 5.6 million viewers per episode with its original TV audience, making it the network's most watched documentary ever. Wilfred, my, my only question about this is, so DraftKings is adding more than a billion dollars in market value today. I sort of, I get it with Oprah and, and Weight Watchers. She, she brings in fans and she brings in consumers. I get it with Kanye West and Gap and Adidas. He's a designer, people love his stuff. With Jordan as a special advisor to the board, it's hard to figure out what exactly the direct sort of benefit is in terms of bringing in new users, more people to DraftKings because he's on the board. Maybe there's a ton of value there, but, but looking at the market rise today, how much is being added to that company, hard to draw that kind of direct line with other sort of major celebrities in right. terms of endorsing and being part of brands. I mean, I, I, totally, I totally get what you mean on that. It's not quite as clear, and, and uh, it remains to be seen if he goes as far as like a Portnoy and starts tweeting about his uh, recommended bets, particularly on his sport where he's <laughs> such an expert, which could 
Den driver, but we're not expecting him to do that. I think either way, though, uh, clearly uh, just his name recognition in what is now becoming a very competitive, uh, saturated field will, will boost uh, the company that he's endorsed. My, my question, though, for you, Sarah, uh, which we were discussing a little bit uh, this morning with Jabari, is won't companies like Nike, where clearly he is so indelibly linked, be a little concerned? I don't think they've got a choice because of the power he adds to the Nike brand. Uh, a little concerned because, you know, this is a, at least a frowned upon uh, part of, 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 the, of the world, uh, the, uh, the business world, uh, sports gambling. It's, it's, it's got definitely some, some baggage and it's not perfect for the, the pure image of, of Nike to try and be a good corporate company. I don't know about that. But first of all, I haven't had any discussions with Nike about this. I know that Jordan is a huge moneymaker for Nike, and it's a huge growth part of the business, the Jordan brand right now, in women's, in children's, not just in, in you know, traditional men's basketball. Uh, so it's a huge, ubiquitous brand, billion-dollar brand for Nike. I'm not sure DraftKings really has that kind of negative connotation maybe as sports gambling used to say in the days when when jordan was involved in it way back when it's it's fully legal it's above board it's a huge trend right now that a lot of companies are participating in including now mgm and as you said it's getting very competitive so i think it's just a part of where the the, the sport and the direction of the sport sure. is going oh, well, i'm not sure they would have a huge problem of with course with the sort of jordan getting in he's 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 pretty He's, he's not spreading, you know, he doesn't spread his bets all no, over the place. Of like course, he's, of he's course pretty still uh, exclusive and, and he is synonymous with Nike in that of brand. Of course it's, uh, it's, it's legal and everything. I just wonder whether there's a bit of a disaster waiting to happen around the corner for, for, for sports betting in, in America. And as you said, there's lots of uh, young growth uh, for Nike. And uh, is this starting to say that we support sports gambling uh, for young people? I mean, we're jumping through a few hoops there. Anyway, uh, let's, let's explore more what it means uh, for DraftKings itself. Barry Jonas uh, from Church Securities joins us. Uh, is this a game changer for, for, for DraftKings, Barry? Look, I think it's a positive, but it, I'd be hard pressed to say game changer. He's not on the board. He's not a sponsor. He's a special advisor to the board. There are regulatory limitations that could influence how impactful he could be here as well. So look, it's helpful. The market's saying about a billion dollars. At one point today, the market was, the DraftKings was flat. But uh, certainly it adds an air of credibility to a space, which, as you say, was at one point an outcast. It will be interesting to see if Larry Bird, Isaiah Thomas, one of his uh, you know, longtime competitors, peers, signs up with, it, with uh, one of DraftKings competitors at some point. I mean, to me, it also just underscores this, this whole market, which is just so sensitive to headline risks, and especially positive headlines like this and flashy headlines. And DraftKings in particular, Barry, around everything happening with sports right now and MLB's games getting canceled and the stock losing 13%. How, how, do, you, how do you trade this name right now when it's so, it, it's, it's proven itself so sensitive to all these short-term headlines and noise? Look, I, I think institutional investors are very cautious. We launched this morning with a hold rating and not much pushback, but clearly retail investors are somewhat enamored by the name. That said, as we start seeing series of catalysts, whether they're positive or negative, the volatility is going to rise. You know, later this month, you have Penn's Barstool app coming. That could threaten market share. You've got COVID obviously always out there. Come October, November, I think 60% of DraftKings float is removed from uh, restrictions and could hit the market. So it's going to be a bumpy ride for sure. And ultimately, we're talking about a thesis that's going to be 10 years in the making. That's when they'll make money. That's when they'll hit their longer term targets. So, uh, you know, definitely a bumpy ride ahead. Barry, thanks so much for joining us. Much appreciated. Thanks. We are at session uh, highs, by the way, as we approach the close, 1.65% uh, higher on the Dow, 470 points. After the break, NVIDIA hits a new record. AMC rolls out the red carpet and Peloton kicks into high gear. We'll take you inside the market, sir. Everybody wants to become a better leader. The new book, How to Lead, Wisdom from the World's Greatest CEOs, Founders, and Game Changers by David M. Rubenstein shows you how. The Essential Leadership Playbook, How to Lead, is available now wherever books are sold. Mr. Wonderful here. It's hard for everyday people to get access to startup investments. But with Start Engine, you can choose between hundreds of startups to build your portfolio. It's your turn to become a shark. Visit StartEngine.com today.
We put everything we had into this. Do not miss the chance to get in. We had an opportunity. We took it. My family is going to come in here and tackle you. <laughs> Do this deal. Shark Tank. Tonight starting 7 Eastern. CNBC. Get yours. I love Made In. I love what Made In represents. With the product, you could tell that there's extreme craftsmanship. You would think a pan is a pan until Made In came along, and I went, wow, these things are something better. The pots and pans that I'm using on an everyday basis are going to create wonderful products in my kitchen. Those are the pans that we use at Alinea. We're going to have the best pans in the world at one of the best restaurants in the world. This is cellulose acetate, a plant-based material that's not only extremely durable, but also quite flexible, making it ideal for Warby Parker glasses, which, by the way, start at $95, including prescription lenses. Try five pairs for free at warbyparker.com. Oh yeah, about those prescription lenses. Warby Parker glasses come standard with custom-cut polycarbonate lenses that have been treated with scratch-resistant and anti-reflective coatings. Nice. Try five pairs for free at warbyparker.com. You should be mad at leaf blowers. You should be mad your neighbor always wants to hang out. And you should be mad your smart fridge is unnecessarily complicated. But you're not mad because you have E-Trade, which isn't complicated. Their tools make trading quicker and simpler so you can take on the markets with confidence. Don't get mad. Get E-Trade and start trading commission-free today. The Market Zone is sponsored by E-Trade. Trade commission free today with no account minimums. Breaking news on trading from Robinhood. Bob Bassani has the story. Bob. Uh, Sarah, we're getting reports from the Wall Street Journal that Robinhood faces a potential civil fraud action over its failure to disclose its practice of selling clients' orders to high-speed trading firm fine could be $10 million. Now, this is not confirmed. Uh, SEC, we've reached out to them. We don't have a comment from them yet. We'll try to get to some more uh, on this. But uh, this obviously goes to the question of disclosure. Were they disclosing enough about where the order flow was going? Uh, and it also raises questions about, is there anything wrong with payment for order flow? This has been going on for many, many years with many other firms, but that may ignite that debate. And by the way, remember, Robinhood is still under investigation for other issues, including that March outage that they had that caused a lot of disruption at the height of all of that craziness. Yeah. Guys, back to you. A little surprised that the issue here is failure to disclose, Bob, because we've all known that they've been right. been doing this. I mean, what, we're talking about, like, failing to fill out the right form to disclose it? As a, It's not like they were keeping it secret, per se. No, uh, but there may be details about how it would, the payments were made, for example, and specifically where it was going. Uh, it, it sounds like a, a minor issue, I know, but that's how the SEC gets people, because they're the ones who make the people fill out the disclosure. And so they can't engage in a philosophical sure. debate about payment for order flow, but that's the right discussion to have. Mm -hmm. Well, zero dollar commissions are not cost free. That's the bottom line. Absolutely. Bob, thanks for that. Uh, much appreciated. No uh, we've got, what, uh, 13 and a half minutes left of the session. We're now in the closing bell market zone. Commercial free coverage of all of the action going into the close. CNBC senior markets commentator Mike Santoli here to break down these crucial moments of the trading day. And today we've got Ritholtz Wealth Management CEO Josh Brown with us as well. Good afternoon to you, Josh. Let's kick things off with the broader market stock surging into the close. The Nasdaq and the S&P 500 on track for record closes once again. The Dow is uh, now less than 2% from its own record high. We're pretty much at session highs, up nearly 500 points on the Dow, 1.7%. And the Nasdaq, the laggard, is up a percent itself. Mike, uh, quite an extraordinary rally into the close uh, in some way a repeat of, uh, of yesterday. Yeah, uh, and just uh, kind of this runaway uh, type action. It's it's fascinating that uh, it's as if the market, to anthropomorphize it a little bit, heard everybody complaining about the most extended crazy momentum stocks out there, uh, Apple, Tesla, Zoom, <laughs> Salesforce, and said, fine, we'll take those four down 
and then it will not affect the rest of the tape whatsoever. We'll buy other stuff. That's what's gone on today, uh, is you've essentially had reversals in those stocks. And it was almost as if during the day, when that action did not spread more instability, and basically, you know, the overall index is held together, that you had uh, fresh money coming in chasing other stuff. Um, so we'll see. I still think we're, we're, you know, we're still in the same dynamic. There's the house money uh, effect in, in play where people have lots of profits, no reason to, to sell in a hurry. You might as well shoulder more risk because you still have a lot of gains. But, uh, you know, it is just kind of creating, you know, incrementally further, uh, further extremes it's like 2017, frankly, all over again. Yeah, I feel like the more, Josh, people say, how, how much higher can this market go up? How much frothier can it get? How crazy is this market? The more it goes higher. Yeah, and the, the bears would say that one thing stock market investors do very well is double count. So they start buying up a stock because they think good news is coming. Then good news comes and they buy more of it. And uh, that's a phenomenon that we've seen playing out really all summer long, continuing into these earnings reports. So when you see a company like Zoom, for example, which absolutely smashes expectations, it's not like the stock was sitting flat in advance of that happening. So in the case of Zoom, I think you got triple counted. Um, but I think what's interesting today, Sarah, 76% of the S&P 500 stocks are now back above their 50-day moving average, which admittedly is noisy. It's a shorter-term moving average. But still, you've got more than three-quarters of the S&P um, doing very well right now, at least in, in the short term. That number is only 55% for the NASDAQ 100. And what makes that astounding is the NASDAQ 100, the Qs, are up 47% in the last six months. So what that tells me is that there is some profit taking going on in the big, big cap tech and consumer discretionary and biotech names that make up that, that triple Q um, index. So while you have a day like today, DocuSign is down, Apple's down, you guys cited a few other names. Um, now you have utilities up 3%. Tesla. You have staples up 1.5%, new highs today. Uh, for the for the consumer uh, consumer discretionary, so you have other stocks coming up here and starting to bang their heads up against the ceiling and look for those new highs, and I think it's very encouraging. A three and a half percent move higher for utilities is unusual. Let's hit Zoom. Leading, you just mentioned leading, it. After leading they the market smashed, today. Or, yeah, utilities leading the market. Real estate right behind. Another one that has underperformed. So, Josh, you mentioned Zoom smashing earnings expectations when it reported Monday. Investors are trying to pick the next stay-at-home winner. Peloton is surging again today after J.P. Morgan raised its price target on the stock to a street high of 105, an 8% move right now. CrowdStrike is getting a boost today ahead of its own earnings report after the bell. But some going-out stocks are winners, too. AMC, the movie theater chain, surging after announcing plans to reopen 140 theaters by Saturday. Josh, stay-at-home winners especially some of those cloud names, which seem to go up every day, or, or reopening trades like movie theaters and airlines and hotels. Which is it? Or maybe both? Well, I, I think it, it, it could be both. I think we should stop. We're like six months into this. I think we should stop with the, um, the teams. I think, I think we, look, uh, Starbucks, which I'm long, has had a really big move over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they were not a, uh, a, a work from home stock. They got killed because people weren't commuting for business anymore, and people weren't traveling. Um, so, but that's working now too. So I think there's room for both. But this is the thing I wanna to say to you, and I want everyone to listen to me. Everyone needs to get this term, work from home stocks, out of their vocabulary, because that's not ac that doesn't accurately describe why these stocks are working and will continue to work way past the point where we have a vaccine and people aren't afraid to go out anymore. We have to stop saying that it's work from anywhere. No more WFH, it's WFA. I need everyone to understand this. The stocks that are working all year because they're quote, work from home. No, it's about the cloud. These stocks were already working before the pandemic. All the pandemic did was accelerate things. And when the pandemic is over, these companies will continue to do well because the trend is not everyone's gonna stay home forever. It's not everyone has to report to the same place in order to do business. So when you think about DocuSign, you should not be saying this is a work from home stock. It's a work from anywhere stock, and it's gonna be with us for, for years in the future, long after we're all trapped in our houses. And I can give you 50 stocks that, that need to be thought of that way.
Uh, NVIDIA shares rallying after Bank of America hiked its price target on the stock to a street high of $650. Josh Lipton's got the details for us. Hey, Josh. Wilf, this week NVIDIA rolling out, introducing new graphics chips. The promise there, more impressive visuals for all those PC gamers. The team at Bank of America saying these new chips should drive a solid replacement cycle for the company. That stock, a monster, now up more than 240% over the past 12 months. NVIDIA isn't alone, though. Intel also making news, announcing new processors, which CEO Bob Swan talked about on CNBC this morning. It addresses those key things that are becoming more and more relevant in terms of how we engage with our PC and how we engage with each other. Now, Intel higher today, but as you can see, they're still well in the red so far this year. Guys, back to you. Yeah, bucking the overall trend, semis have been so strong, up th another 3%, and year-to-date up 30% as a group. Josh Lipton, Josh, thank you. Let's hit Macy's. Shares of Macy's have been volatile all day after initially jumping on strong online sales numbers in the second quarter. The struggling department store reported a narrower-than-expected loss, beat revenue estimates this morning, and saw digital sales rise 53% compared to a year ago. But Macy's same-store sales missed expectations, down about 35% for the quarter. Joining us for more is Matt Boss, retail analyst at J.P. Morgan, with an underrate rating on Macy's. Matt, always good to have you. It, it doesn't matter what the numbers were this quarter, does it? It's the, it's the view forward, and, and I'm not sure investors really got that today from the CEO or from the call. Did you? Yeah, you, you nailed it on the head. There's a couple components here. Nike did it, or Macy's did a nice job cutting costs this quarter. SGNA was down 35%. So when you looked at the print on the surface, you had an earnings beat right out of the gates. Digging deeper into the print, to me, the key piece is here physical stores, sales are down 40%, and e commerce is only up 25% exiting the quarter. That's after being up as much as 80% in May. So you have digital sales that are moderating, brick and mortar store sales that are materially negative. And now you head into the back half of the year, the all important back to school and holiday with a, with a company that pre pandemic was three fourths of its revenues were derived from that, from those stores. And now you have revenues in those stores that are down nearly 50%. And so, I think looking forward, it's all value and convenience. Those were two el elusive dynamics that this company was missing prior to the pandemic. And I think all that you have right now is everything in, in acceleration as you think about the winners and losers coming out of the crisis. So, so Matt, how is this stock priced at the moment? Is it, is it priced as if people still question its, its long-term future? If, if it does survive into next year, will it, will it be rallying significantly? So I think it is a company that will survive. I think it's a company that will continue to restructure. I think we've now seen four or five restructurings. Right now we're in the midst of the Polaris strategy. They've, they've announced 2.1 billion in cost savings. But to me, that's a company that just, just continues to shrink. So our estimates are next year, Macy's revenue base will be 15% below its pre-pandemic 2019 revenue base. And we do not have this company breaking even from a profitability perspective until 2022. So to your point, I think you have a mixed bag out there from the investment community that I don't think that this is necessarily a going concern in the near term, or frankly, in the intermediate term. But I do think it's a company that will have less stores, a smaller revenue base, and a smaller expense base. And so you have an EBITDA base that is in multi-year perpetual uh, decline. But again, circling back to pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic, that's how we're trying to pick the winners and losers. Department stores were in decline before this. Off-pricers and dollar stores were taking share. And I think that's the same dynamic you're going to have going forward that we had before all of this. So pick a winner. Are there any that look too cheap to you? I know you don't like Macy's. I think the discounters, as you look at the dollar stores and discounters, mm -hmm. so the dollar generals, those retailers that during this process, during this crisis have picked up market share, I think the duration and the sustainability is longer than most believe. And I think the off pricers, nothing's changed in terms of the multi-year market share dynamics. And if anything, 
I think as you think about a TJ Maxx, a Burlington, and a Ross stores, on a multi-year basis, they're going to come out of this with less brick and mortar competition, less department stores, and greater values because I think they're going to mean more to the to the to the multi-year vendors. Uh, the last would be on the on the well, athletic. I think Nike and Lululemon continue to have opportunity and momentum. I know you love those names. Matt Boss, thank you for joining us. Thanks from JP Morgan. Ross stores, by the way, down 20% year to date. Mike Santoli, just give us your thoughts here as we march into another record high close. We're seeing every group higher except for energy. What stands out to you and what are the internals showing? What stands out is really the ability of the market to um, to kind of get into this buying panic mode without those those leadership momentum stocks uh, doing the work. Uh, so it seems as if it's actually broadened out a fair bit over the course of the day. It started out being uh, much more choppy. You look there at the uh, up versus down volume in the New York Stock Exchange, better than two to one to the positive. NASDAQ not quite as strong, but you do have more than 250 new highs on the NASDAQ. So it's, it's pretty inclusive as these things go you know take a look at some of the groups here energy not one that's participating uh, industrials versus energy on the day uh, is uh, is obviously being dragged down by crude but industrials and equal weight of consumer discretionary which are basically cyclical plays is the economy getting better do we want to be positioned for that trade are definitely improving even if they haven't been outright leaders of this move the volatility index getting so much attention uh, as you know we've been talking for such a long time has there's this bid in the market for protection against election related volatility Volatility. I wonder if we've gotten sort of pre-hedged and we're flinching ahead of this event and it's going to come as no surprise to anybody if we have election issues. Uh, but so far, that's still going on and the NASDAQ version of the VIX is screaming higher, has been for a while, mostly because mm -hmm. uh, people buying call options because they want upside bets. Just under one minute left of the session. Uh, to Mike's point that the traditional leaders aren't doing all the work, that certainly applies to Apple and Tesla, both of which uh, are in the red. That said, uh, you do have uh, Alphabet, uh, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, all nicely higher. Alphabet up as much as uh, 4%. In terms of the sector performance, as we've been discussing, utilities, real estate, healthcare are the best. Energy is at the bottom in the red, the only one in the red. Uh, and technology is uh, second best the second worst performer, but still up a full percent itself. As we approach uh, the close of 20 seconds left, it will be another record high for the S&P, up 1.6% today. Another record high for the NASDAQ Composite, up over 1% today, albeit the laggard of the major indices, uh, which was a turnaround from yesterday and a turnaround from even this morning at the open. And the Dow Jones Industrial, up 466 points, 1.6%, getting closer to its own record close, about 2% away from its record high. 22nd record close for the S&P of 2020. It is amazing. Welcome back to Closing Bell. If you are just joining us, I'm Sarah Eisen here with Wilford Frost, along with Mike Santoli, CNBC Senior Markets Commentator. Strong rally on Wall Street today with a big push in the final hour of trade. Take a look at where we finished up. 452 points higher. And take a look at what happened in that final hour. Really strong close again. Just the momentum continuing up one and a half percent on the Dow. As far as what led us there, Coca-Cola actually the biggest gainer in the Dow. Dow also, the chemical company, did well. IBM. The only two losers were actually Apple and CRM, which is Salesforce. They have been major winners in this market. Both of them are at record highs, so taking a bit of a pause today. The S&P 500 closing up one and a half percent. A new all-time high yet again. And we're higher for eight of the last nine sessions just to show you how strong it's been most groups closed positive in fact all groups except for energy utilities was the strongest group today for a change nasdaq up one percent that'll do it a record high for the nasdaq again and the russell 2000 index of small caps up almost one percent nine tenths of one percent so some strengths there in the small caps despite the fact that they've underperformed all year investors now set to digest earnings from CrowdStrike, it's been a super hot cloud play. Cloudera, also hot. Rocket Companies, first since going public. And apparel maker PVH will bring you all the results as soon as they are out. And we will also break down PVH's results and take the pulse of the consumer when we are joined exclusively by its CEO, Manny Chirico, right after those numbers hit. Joining us, though, first to talk about this Market Rally, Josh Brown from Ritholtz Wealth Management is still with us. Omar Aguilar from Charles Schwab joins the conversation. Though first, Mike, to you, to, I feel like you have to justify the fact that the market goes up so much yeah. every single day. Another percent and a half move despite 
Weak economic data, ADP came in much lower. More virus hotspots that we're tracking, like Alabama with rising positivity rates and some real headwinds on valuations, on earnings, yeah. on, on the outlook, and, and yet here we are, a yeah, new high. And, and today as well, it's not a perfectly clean story, right? The dollar was up today. We've been benefiting from a lower dollar in the stock market. The yields were lower, and therefore all the bond proxy stocks uh, were up a lot, like utilities, like you mentioned. But that usually is not enough to get the entire index excited as it was today. Bull markets make you uncomfortable almost as much as bear markets in the sense that they don't really <laughs> allow you a comfortable pace of figuring out why things are happening. I could certainly make the case that all we're doing is getting to more extreme extremes in the very short term. The upside targets are really hard to come by right now in terms of this move. One or two percent higher, and this is the best rally off of a low in history since 1938. Uh, so it's not as if uh, you, you know, you're chasing a lot of easy models for, for how this ought to go. But the basic inputs are early cycle recovery story combined with late cycle risk appetites and very easy money. And that's enough, uh, I think, on a story-driven basis to keep people uh, you know, excited in the short term with this extra public energy coming in from retail. But, but Mike, I mean, if this is a bit of a, a broadening out and the economy's doing better type story, it's odd what's going on in the bond market. Last week on Thursday, we jumped from 140 on the 30-year up to 155 yeah. on, on hopes for more inflation coming through. All of that and more has slipped back over the next four or five uh, trading sessions. It's not a particularly bullish sign for the economy. Well, no, the bond market's not giving a bullish sign, but the bond market yield-wise has been just range-bound for months, uh, even in the face of, of a lot of economic numbers that have gotten better. So it seems to me that that's just kind of anchored by the Fed not moving for years to come or, or whatever the assumption is. Um, so, no, I, I, again, I don't think that this was a very neat and tidy story of, you know, across asset classes singing the same tune. It's just, uh, you know, kind of a grab for equity exposure uh, when people, had, for whatever reason, felt like the market wasn't going to give you uh, a chance. Not sure how much is left in that, though. Omar, at Schwab, you've got a pretty good view into retail trading behavior. How much of, of these moves do you think is driven by that right now? Well, I think, uh, you know, a lot of investors are still, you know, are, I would say, in two camps. Uh, on one hand, there are the those investors that feel and take these market rally as a, just the fact that re, the economy is going to recover eventually and catch up. We are all the way back to the levels of stock market and commodities and exchange rates all the way that to February levels. And therefore, you know, the economy is going to be, you know, catching up over the next you know, 18 months or so. And that set of investors are the ones that are looking for opportunity to just try to get into the market more quickly. Uh, on the other hand, we still have a significant amount of very skeptical investors that are just worried that there will be a, enough of a noise going in through the rest of the year with the elections, with the second wave of potential, you know, virus cases where we actually see the China US trade discussions and I think the number of bankruptcies that continue to grow that obviously have kept a lot of people on the sidelines. So I think it's a very you know bipolar with a set of, of, of sentiment that you can actually see overall. Uh, I think it was interesting to see the leaders today being some of those sectors that are being sort of the least favored for the year. And I think that just gets a sense of how people are trying to just have a more better diversification across the strategies and having to take that up from the leaders. Josh, what do you make of the fact that Apple and Tesla ran out of steam today? I don't know. I'm not sure that there's necessarily a, a great deal of meaning in that. Obviously, these stocks were heavily traded uh, well all year, but specifically around the, the split. There was a lot of excitement. And maybe when the excitement wears off, some people say, OK, that was fun. I'm moving on. I really wouldn't make much more of it than that in the case of Apple. In the case of Tesla, it's another share sale. And, you know, five million shares here, five million shares there. Eventually, like you sop up a lot of the demand. So um, that's, that's not me calling a top in Tesla, but. When you drop that many shares on the market or you tell people you're about to, it does have an impact. Mike, I feel like we need a sentiment check right right here at the top of the show. Just, just where are, where, where is, is there euphoria in the market at this point? And 
What kind of levels are we at? And where does it signal as the next move for the market? It's not an across the board euphoria, although people are fully, I think, deferred to the strength of the market. If you look at things like um, investment advisors on a weekly basis, yes, they're super bullish uh, relative to the, the people who are bearish at this point, near the highs of the last few years. A lot of these things are showing uh, bullish extremes since, let's say, early 2018. Uh, however, you know, the average Wall Street price target is way below where we're trading right now. You're not seeing Seeing equity fund flows all that heavy, so you don't see that much in the way of more traditional retail investors chasing it with their dollars just because the market's up a lot and they don't feel like they have to. Uh, so I think it's not as easy as to say, oh, it's over bullish, but it's right now. If you were able to make the case three and four and five months ago that people are way too negative, they hate this market, and it just has to go higher, that's far less true than it ever was uh, during this whole run. Hedge funds, it seems like their exposure's now been, been ramped as well, according to some numbers I'm just looking at. So, yes, people are fully bullish, but that doesn't necessarily mean that rings a bell at the top because, you know, markets tend to be able to kind of deal with that for a long time uh, when they're having these uptrending moves. It's much different than at the lows when super extreme fear tends to be a better indicator of a reversal. Uh, Omar, are clients doing some hedging at all? Are they buying some protective type assets or is this just uh, buying equities going long the, the winners? That's a, that's, a, that's a great question. And I certainly, you know, clients continue to ask a lot of questions about protection, uh, whether it's through options and strategies or just in general, the traditional, you know, lower beta type of uh, strategies or trying to even have higher allocations to defensive assets. Uh, it is very natural reaction in this part of the cycle when you see the, the level of the bull market that we have seen. On the other hand, because what we have seen uh, so far is, you know, this shift in sentiment because of the lower to negative real yields that we have seen globally in the bond market you know a lot of the you know clients are actually obviously seeking for that level of income somewhere else and i think the combination of seeking income in other asset classes with the, the need for potential protection going into higher volatility towards the end of the year has actually made some of these market dynamics slightly different than the traditional recovery we have seen. It is very um, unusual to see this level of, of, of bull market when some of the issues related to a crisis or a recession sources haven't been fully resolved. Josh Brown and Omar Aguilar, thanks both for joining us. Up next, we will ask famed investor Mike Novogratz what he thinks is the biggest threat to what he calls the market's liquidity-driven frenzy. We're back in 90 seconds. Introducing Schwab Stock Slices. For as little as $5, now anyone can own companies in the S&P 500, even if their shares cost more. At $5 a slice, you could own 10 companies for $50 instead of paying thousands. All commission-free online. Schwab Stock Slices, an easy way to start investing or to give the gift of stock ownership. Schwab, own your tomorrow. When the world gets complicated, a lot goes through your mind. With Fidelity Wealth Management, your dedicated advisor can give you straightforward advice and tailored recommendations. That's the clarity you get with Fidelity Wealth Management. My reputation was trashed online. I felt completely helpless. My entire career and business were in jeopardy. I called Reputation Defender. Take control of your online reputation. Get your free reputation report card at reputationdefender.com. Find out your online reputation today and let the experts help you repair it. They were able to restore my good name. Visit reputationdefender.com or call 1-877-866-8555. Danny. Do you remember what this is? Beautiful, nice, or so cheesy. Start something great. Try video on Match. Stocks finishing sharply hard today, continuing a strong start to September. Both the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq closing at record highs, with the Nasdaq topping 12,000 for the first time. Joining us now is Galaxy Digital CEO and founder Mike Novogratz. Mike, great to see you as uh, as always. We we, we continue to march higher and higher uh, on the uh, on the broader equity markets uh, something that that I know has uh, surprised you you've you've made money in other assets rather than these uh, these these tech stocks do you, do you get tempted to to start buying them at this stage at any point no listen i think we are close to the uh, 
end of what I think is a speculative frenzy. And you look at the price action of Tesla the last couple of days. And if you go back to 1999, you look at Qualcomm, which really was like the bellwether stock of the whole internet boom. You know, Qualcomm had a split, it was December 31st. The next two days it exploded up just like Tesla. And that marked the high of Qualcomm for the whole cycle. Uh, I think we put the high in for Tesla for the whole cycle. Uh, we're going to slowly unwind some of this crazy leverage. Uh, what's interesting though is this bull market's not giving up. It's like a bull with a, a bit between its teeth, climbing up a muddy hill and it just keeps charging and other things are falling off. We had a big correction in Bitcoin today. We had a big correction, a small correction in gold and the dollar, other risk assets. Uh, but, you know, the money seems to be rotating from one asset to another in, in U.S. equities and now European equities. And so certainly the bull market's not over yet. Uh, I do feel like we're getting close. Do, do you think rotation would be the result uh, if we are, if we do cross the line in terms of when some of those tech stocks have to correct, or would everything be dragged down, including the likes of Bitcoin and gold, like they were in, in March? Or would this time be different for them? Would they act as protective assets? You know, I, I do think, listen, there'll be some correlation. If there's a big risk off, all assets will go down some. I do think both the dollar and Bitcoin will be will decouple from risk at one point, right? Once you get the, the weak hands out, I think it'll be protected. But but the first leg down, it will be. Uh, it's just leverage comes out of the system. Um, it's a very good question though, right? We, today, I expected the market to go down and we saw much more rotation and the market actually going up, right? The NASDAQ looked pretty ugly at one point and just came ripping right back. Uh, the S&P never looked ugly. And so there's still a lot of cash in the system. Uh, I don't know, we have an election coming in, you know, less than two months. As we get closer, the uncertainty around the election, I think, you know, if Biden wins, there are tax implications for the market that could substantially uh, lead it to a much lower uh, level, right? You raise capital gains taxes from, mm -hmm. you know, 20 to 40, and markets are going down, not up. I was just going to ask you about that because... President Trump just tweeted about the market close, perhaps watching closing bell, noting the fact that the Dow closed above 29,000. He said, you are so lucky to have me as your president with Joe Hyden. I think that's a new nickname. It would crash, Mike. So are you saying you agree with the president there? I Listen, I think the market will go lower if Biden wins for a while, and then it will regroup just like it always does. Uh, it's going to go lower because they're going to make tax structures. You know, if you think about what happened, what's happened since COVID, right? With Jeff Bezos becoming worth two hundred billion dollars, and Elon on one hundred and fifteen, and all of this staggering, you know, staggering wealth being created in the in the, the stockholders, in the in the, in the one percenters, and the rest of the country is still suffering. It's just not good for the psychology of the country in general. And so, Trump talks to the people that own stocks, which is less than ten percent of the country that, that owns the bulk of them. 85% of stocks are, are owned by 10% of people. Um, but the rest of the country don't really care so much that Tesla's going up every day uh, or was going up every day. And so I do think there's a disconnect between the real economy and the stock market. And, you know, Trump likes to take credit for the, for the stock market. He doesn't really deserve the credit. The credit really goes to Jerome Powell, who just keeps pushing in the liquidity. And this is a liquidity-driven rally, and it's created a psychology of buy any asset. Uh, to the point where things are at ludicrous valuation and they can't last. Or, or bit, I guess, Mike, in, in the U.S. higher than in Europe, uh, about 55% of households do have exposure to the to the stock market. Uh, that's not 80 or 90%, I, I accept, but it's higher than some other developed nations. Um, in, in terms of what you're buying at the moment, uh, given that uh, Bitcoin and gold have had great runs as well, given that you think we're due a pullback, what, what are the things that people should buy if they want to buy some protection or even buy some exposure to the market that hasn't run up yet? Listen, there are there are some stocks, right, that have just way underperformed. You saw it today, some of the financials, the cyclicals starting to, to rally. So I'd be in the defensives or I would actually be on the sidelines. I mean, there, there are times to just be on the sidelines and wait for the correction. And if you miss the last hurrah, you miss the last hurrah. Uh, and so I'd be in the S&P, not the NASDAQ, right? The S&P took out 3,400. Uh, when you take out highs, you usually have a nice little rally. And so the S&P probably outperforms uh, the NASDAQ for the time being after a, a huge uh, spate of underperformance. Uh, but in general, I'm cautious. I'm cautious risk. This is usually not a great month. And we've had such a huge run. It wouldn't surprise me sometime in the middle of this month, 
we have a complete reversal. What about Bitcoin? I know you're super bullish on Bitcoin, Mike. How do you see the, the election and the impact of, of the pandemic, the new Fed policy all impacting the price there? Shouldn't, shouldn't we see more of a rise in Bitcoin if inflation is now the thing? Yeah, listen, I think Bitcoin is, is it's had a small correction in the last day. It almost took out, it took out 12,000 briefly yesterday. It rejected there. And so, you know, we can get washed out, but it trades fine. We're seeing more and more customers come into the space every day. You know, there's a bit of a speculative frenzy going around in the crypto space, not in Bitcoin, in what we would call decentralized finance. And so some of the money from Bitcoin, from the classic Bitcoin holders has moved over into some of these other coins, coins by the name of Sushi and, you know, we, we fear YFI, you know, there's this new hot, sexy uh, venture space called DeFi or decentralized finance. So that's, that's dragged some of the luster off Bitcoin from that Bitcoin community, from the crypto community. But the institutions continue to come, uh, remain very bullish on Bitcoin. We're buying on any pullbacks. Still think we go to 14,000 and 20,000 within the next six to 12 months, if not higher. Um, and that's really just a Fed story and, a, and, a, and a, an uncertainty in the world story. Sushi coin, that's a new one. Mike, thank you. I think it dropped 34% today. You, Mike, you would have around. loved to own some sushi coin, trust me. <laughs> you know, it went up from, you know, I mean, I love sushi, so. <laughs> Mike Novogratz, thank you. Uh, we've Thanks got some breaking lot. earnings well. news here to report. PVH, I'll bring those numbers to you. The retailer that owns Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein with a huge bottom line beat, reporting 13 cents adjusted on profitability. The expectation on this one was a loss of $2.43. The highest analyst estimate that we found was a loss of $1.20. So that was way off the mark. As far as revenues, that was a beat as well. Not quite as big. $1.58 billion is what they're reporting. $1.25 was the estimate. The story here was tremendous cost cutting sgna expenses down 24 percent so that's what fed into the big profit beat gross margins improved 56 percent versus 42 i mean excuse me 54 percent a year ago it looks like digital was also part of the strength here especially on the uh, sales picture revenue through digital channels growing over 50 percent and sales that were through its directly operated digital commerce business were up 87%, so some, some strong growth there. Uh, as far as what we can expect in the future, PVH is saying it expects revenue in the second half of the year to decline 25% versus the year ago period. They also give some color on traditional wholesale partners. Remember, they're a big department store play, saying that they're planning their store-based businesses conservatively, which will result in reduction of shipments to those customers. The stock is reacting positively to the big beats, up almost 6% here after hours. We're gonna to talk to Manny Chirico, the CEO, in just a few minutes about what's actually driving the business right now and how he is getting a look forward with so much pain right now in department stores, in apparel, and in accessories. Tough categories to be in, definitely not essential retail type yeah. stuff. Uh, still though, Wilfred, really big beat. They, they've managed their costs pretty conservatively here and that led to a big profit increase. Yeah, tough category, uh, strong quarter. Looking forward to that interview coming up uh, shortly. Meantime, some other earnings crossing the tape. CrowdStrike uh, numbers are out. Aditi Roy has them for us. Hey, Aditi. Hey there, Wilf. That's right. Shares of CrowdStrike plummeting right now, uh, down between 5 and 6%, despite the fact that the company beat on both the top and the bottom lines. EPS coming in at a $0.03 cent profit versus analyst expectations of a loss of $0.01. Cent. Uh, revenue coming in at $199 million. The street was expecting $188.5 million. Subscription revenue, nearly 90% of the company's revenues comes from subscriptions. That also was a, a huge beat, uh, or rather it was... 184.3 million that was up about 90 percent year over year and the company also raised its fiscal year guidance and also beat on uh, expectations uh, for uh, Q3 and fiscal year uh, on the top and bottom lines however uh, one potential uh, reason why we might be seeing that this the stock uh, decline right now is that the company added 969 net new subscription customers. It appears to be a small number. In fact, one of the analyst reports I was looking at said that that number may be on the smaller side, but we will have to listen in on the call to see if the deal sizes are larger than thought. So we'll dig into this more. Uh, but again, shares for the year, though, 
uh, to date is are up uh, about 180 percent. Back to you guys. Didi, thanks so much for that one. Uh, Rocket Company's earnings also out. Diana Oleg. Yeah, and this is the first earnings report since its IPO early last month. Uh, we have revenue of $5.04 billion and net income of $3.46 billion. Uh, it's unclear if this is comparable since this is the first report since the IPO. But we do have shares. They were up around 2% for the day. They're down around 6% uh, in after hours. But remember, this stock is up nearly 78% since its IPO last month. Now, CEO Jay Farmer, Farner is saying that Rocket Companies obviously had a very strong second quarter thanks to... Uh, incredibly scalable mortgage origination platform that allowed us to uh, to in, to meet unprecedented demand. Now, as a result, we were able to help more clients this quarter than in any other quarter in our 35-year history. Rocket is looking to gain 25% market share of all mortgages. Of course, remember, mortgage applications are way up at the end of the summer with purchase demand up over 28% year over year and refinance demand up over 40%. So clearly, this is the business to be in right now. So again, no comps on this, but the stock is still down despite these very strong earnings. Back to you guys. Diana, thank you. Cloudera earnings are also out. Let's get to Josh Lipton with those numbers. Josh. So, Sarah, Cloudera reporting Q2 EPS year of 10 cents. The street was at 6 cents. Revenue comes in at 214 million. The street was at 208.1 million. Looking ahead for Q3, they're guiding for between 8 and 10 cents. Uh, and also been at 7 cents. And for revenue, they're saying to look for between 207 and 210 million. Consensus there was for 206 million. And for the year, the guidance uh, on the bottom line, 32 to 35 cents. Street was at 28 cents. And revenue between 839 and 853 million. Estimates are called for about 839 million. As for the segments, uh, subscription comes in at 191.5 million and services at 22.8 million. Slipping here in the after hours, though, remember heading into this report, Cloudera had surged about 180% off its March lows. Conference calls at 5 p.m. Eastern. Guys, back to you. Josh, thank you. Up next, Mike Santoli is back with a look at what history says about the strength of this record rally and whether stocks are starting to look expensive. We'll be right back. It's Nutrisystem for Men with a month of food and shakes delivered to your door. Stay home, stay safe. Nutrisystem comes right to my door. I don't have to think about it. This is breakfast, this is snack, this is lunch, this is dinner. Nutrisystem for Men has got you covered to stock up the pantry and help you stay healthy. Act now and save 50% off a month of food and 50% off a month of shakes. Go online or call 888-478-FIT3 to save 50% on a month of food and shakes. Phil Swift here for Flex Paste, the incredible rubberized paste. Right out of the tub, it clings to the surface, and it instantly fills gaps and holes. Flex Paste dries to a strong, flexible rubber, perfect for sealing RVs and campers. Use it to help prevent flood damage. Stop rodents from getting in your home, or even crafts and hobbies. Get Flex Paste and the Flex Seal family of products at FlexSealProducts.com. Journalism is not about emotion or persuasion or opinion. Journalism is about gathering accurate information and reporting facts. It takes hard reporting work and a commitment to getting it right. Journalism has never been more important. Getting through this time of crisis requires the truth. That's what we'll deliver every night. The facts, the truth, the news with Shepard Smith. Premieres September 30th, CNBC. I'm finally the king of my own castle, but my castle has leaks. So I use Thumbtack to find electricians, roofers, and plumbers. I can check out reviews, prices, and book the pro I like on the app. So anytime something breaks, I know exactly where to go. Download Thumbtack today. You can get anything instantly with an app, even toilet paper. But what about someone to fix your toilet? Thumbtack's the app that finds you people fast. See prices, reviews, and chat with local pros right in the app. Download Thumbtack today. This is a keepsake frame. This is actually a photo from my wedding. I'm Adam Weiss, founder and CEO of Keepsake. If you're anything like me, you've probably got 7,000 photos on your phone. And sometimes the moments that really matter most end up getting lost. That's why I made Keepsake, the mobile app that makes it easy to have your photos printed, framed, and shipped to your doorstep. So if you've got a special photo on your phone, install the free Keepsake app. We would love a chance to frame it for you. 
Redefining the Future of Business, a CNBC Summit, October 6th. Insight and ideas from the most influential voices disrupting the next decade of work. Register now at cnbcevents.com slash work. Costco out with August sales. Total comp sales up 13.2% above expectations of 10.4%. In the U.S., ex-fuel sales and currency uh, sales were up 14.3 percent. Uh, some uh, strong numbers uh, from Costco uh, continuing a, a recent uh, theme. Expectations were high and, and they beat them. Right. They're an essential retailer doing well, like a Walmart and a Target. But they were doing well before this pandemic and crisis uh, on good execution and, of course, those membership subscriber numbers. Let's go back to Mike Santoli now, who's putting the Nasdaq's recent surge into some historical perspective as the index, Mike, closes above 12,000 for the first time ever. Yeah, round number stuff, 12,029 on the Dow, uh, pushing 3,600 on the S&P. This is the, uh, the Nasdaq year-to-date in blue compared to the full year 2009. So this was the prior bear market low. Uh, you saw the huge surge off that level. Now, you know, that low bit there happened two weeks earlier and it was not as deep in the hole. So right here, we're ahead of the game. And if you kind of synced up the lows, you'd be even more ahead. Now, what you saw there is further upside, but after some chopping around and sideways action, really want to emphasize the NASDAQ back then was way, way, way below its all time high. It had been down, going down uh, for a couple of years. It was about a quarter of its 2000 high. So it's different now that we're actually scaling into fresh record territory and then on the valuation side just a snapshot of what's gone on in the last decade this is the forward price earnings multiple for the nasdaq 100 and the s p 500 what you see is it goes in these sort of regimes right we couldn't get above about 15 for a few years and then got repriced a little bit higher and then 18 or so for the s p 500 was a ceiling before we get into this phase we've released higher to 23 obviously on somewhat depressed earnings at least for the next couple of quarters and then you see what's happened to the nasdaq it was contained under 20 for years it seemed like that was basically reasonable and now here we are shooting well above 30. This is what the market will tolerate right now both looking across the the valley of, of what earnings are doing as well as just feeling as if very low discount rates are enough to to get valuations here but it doesn't mean that it forgives uh, the market for this entry point if you bought them here get it doesn't get you higher returns later just because you can justify the valuation today based on what interest rates are doing or what the Fed is doing guys. Mike, thank you. Mike Santoli. Checking out shares of PVH higher after hours after a big beat. The company behind brands like Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger coming in with much better, ex much better earnings than expected. 13 cents. The expectation was for a loss of more than two bucks. While PVH saying strength in its digital commerce business all certainly helped the top line. It does expect revenue, though, in the second half of the year to fall 25%. Let's go to PBH CEO Manny Chirico, who joins us now for an exclusive interview. Manny, it's great to have you here, fresh off of those numbers. Clearly, you cut back a lot on expenses, which, which drove the profit. Tell us a little bit about what else you were going through, as I'm sure most of the stores where you supply your clothing were closed for a good chunk of the quarter. Sure, exactly. Um, uh, during the quarter, uh, the sto our stores and our key customer stores were probably closed for uh, basically a third of the quarter, a full month. Uh, so that's part of the decline. But despite that, you know, when we initially talked about where we would be for this quarter, we talked about sales being down close to 50 percent. And actually, we significantly outperformed that uh, revenue guidance and uh, came in at down 33 percent. Uh, that's almost $300 million better than we anticipated. So really seeing some momentum in the business, particularly in our international markets. Europe for us is very strong. Our China business has really come back very strong. The toughest business we're having right now continues to be in the United States. We're outperforming our projections, but still well behind where we are in Asia and Europe. How much of it is just the fact that department stores are, are in a world of hurt in the United States right now? We saw the Macy's numbers today. I didn't get a very clear, even picture of a recovery there. And we've seen so many bankruptcies in the space. How, how tied to that is the weakness you're, you're projecting here in the U.S.? Well, look, they're an important component of our business. But just to put it into perspective, North American department stores in 2019 represented about 12 percent of our total sales. And as we go forward, I think by the end of this year, that number will be closer to eight to nine percent. So 
They're important to us. They're great partners for us as we work together, but it's not as significant a component of business as it was, let's say, five or six years ago. Uh, that said, um, you know, they're starting to see some improvement in their business and their online business, their dot-com business, and the Macy's dot-com business, the Kohl's dot-com business has been very strong for us, as well as the pure plays that we sell like Amazon, Zolando, um, in Europe. So that portion of the business has been strong, but brick and mortar retail, particularly department stores, you've seen the numbers, they've been much more challenged given the pandemic. When you look at the U.S. outlook for your business, Manny, how much does it rest for the rest of 2020 on, on whether there's more fiscal stimulus or, or, or is that not as relevant perhaps as it, as it seemed uh, earlier in the year? You know, this, this, it's treacherous trying to project out and trying to understand all the moving parts in the business. Clearly, um, the, the response here in the United States from a fiscal point of view has been strong. But the response comparatively to the rest of the world as it relates to the pandemic and the control of that pandemic has been much weaker. So where there hasn't been as much fiscal support, let's say in Europe and in Asia, the fact that the pandemic is under much better control there, our business is that much more uh, strong there. And we've been able to really capture back more and more of our sales. So I think it's really controlling the pandemic that's going to be the bigger issue for us going forward here in the States versus just throwing more stimulus at it. But given where we are, I, I don't in any way doubt that it's important to keep that stimulus going. And hopefully that can come through in the next few weeks. Manny, what does the holiday season look like this year? <laughs> you know, that's a great question. And if I had a crystal ball and knew the answer, I could, I could make a lot of money. But let's ha let me tell you how we're approaching it. We're approaching it very cautiously and conservatively for a couple of reasons. Um, we're, we, we're well positioned if the consumer is there and we can sell, but we're also trying to position ourselves so we don't get caught with a significant amount of inventory. So actually projecting the business to in the for the second half and in the fourth quarter to be down about 25 percent um if if business is more robust we're in an excellent position to capture that business but if we're going to project out we're going to take a more conservative posture i think you have to consider a couple of things is i think the capacity issues at retail in stores where we're trying to keep capacity of the store to 50 percent in those high traffic selling uh, times of the year, like Christmas, that becomes more of a challenge for us as well. How comfortable is the consumer going to be uh, coming to, uh, to malls of any type, uh, either outlet malls or even, even standalone retail stores? How comfortable are they going to be coming back and shopping in those stores? I think there'll be activity but I think traffic patterns probably will be under pressure and store hours have also been curtailed. So where fourth quarter holiday tends to be an even bigger brick and mortar presence as a percentage of the business, I think that piece of the business will be under some degree of pressure because of the pandemic. I think the real opportunity will be online. Mm -hmm. uh, we made, we've made the investments to make sure we're in excellent position to capture that both directly with our owned and operated sites that we do ourselves and with our key partners, uh, Macy's.com, Kohl's.com with our Amazon business, as well as Zalando and Tmall in Asia. Uh, those are going to be key areas for us. So I think we're in a good position yeah. to outperform the sales guidance, uh, but I still think you have to be somewhat cautious as you approach the uh, fourth quarter. Good to know. Finally, Manny, just wanted to ask you about fashion trends. People want <laughs> comfort. People staying closer to home. I'm, I'm wondering what that means for your two biggest brands. Calvin Klein, huge underwear business. I, I expect we, we all still need that. Tommy Hilfiger, I, I mean, it was hot. Went through a few good years with Champion and Fila and all the 90s brands with the logos all over. But where, where are those brands right now in terms of what consumers want and, and how they're living? Sure. Look, the Tommy Hilf I'll start with Tommy first. The Tommy Hilfiger brand has been very, very strong, both domestically and internationally. It continues. 
and we have a significant casual component to that business. Uh, T-shirt, jeans, um, uh, active sportswear, that component of the business, very, very strong. On the Calvin Klein side of the business, you touched on our, uh, our men's underwear business, our women's intimate business and loungewear business, off the charts, very strong. Our partners that work with us, G3, their performance and active sportswear businesses for both brands, also very, very strong. So those two businesses in this environment are able to hold their own. The, the portions of the business that are under more pressure, are, as you can imagine, is our dress-up business, which the, our high fashion brands like Calvin and Tommy have a component in, and our heritage brands, we're the largest dress shirt company in the world. Those businesses are under significant pressure right now. And I think as the as people return back to the workplace, you'll see a resurgence there. But right now, next six months, uh, that dress up, refined uh, business is gonna be under more precious, tailored clothing, those type of businesses will continue to be under pressure, but we'll be able to maximize those more casual, intimate underwear, loungewear businesses, which is such a key part of our business. Manny, thank you for joining us to talk through those that results. It was a pleasure, thank you guys. Fresh off the relief. Manny Trico, ahead of his call tomorrow. 200%, that's how much shares of weight loss company Metafast are up since just late March. Coming up, we're gonna ask the company CEO how new health trends are driving revenue growth. Before money, people traded goods, tools, cattle, grain, even shells represented value. Then currency came along. They made it out of copper, gold, silver, wampum. Soon people decided to put all that value into a piece of paper, then proceeded to wave goodbye to value, printing unlimited amounts of money as they passed the buck to the future. That's why it's time for digital currency and your investment in the Grayscale funds. Go digital, go Grayscale. My reputation was trashed online. I felt completely helpless. My entire career and business were in jeopardy. I called Reputation Defender. Take control of your online reputation. Get your free reputation report card at reputationdefender.com. Find out your online reputation today and let the experts help you repair it. They were able to restore my good name. Visit reputationdefender.com or call 1-877-866-8555. Let's go, K-5. You are clear for land. Roger. Roger that. Night Scope K-5 reporting for duty. To learn more and schedule a demo, please visit us at www.nightscope.com. Time now for a CBC News update with Sue Herrera. Hi, Sue. Hello, everybody. Here's what's happening at this hour. Iowa's Governor Kim Reynolds defending Iowa State University's decision to host an expected 25,000 fans at that school's football season opener, despite a recent surge in infections across the state. At a news conference today, Reynolds said people should not go to the game if they don't think it will be safe. You can go to CNBC.com to see what new restrictions the White House is recommending for Iowa. And take a look at this. There it is, the new flag or proposed flag for the state of Mississippi. In November, voters will get to choose the new design or stick with the current flag, which features the Confederate battle flag. And in Hawaii, a flyover of Pearl Harbor to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Guests gathered on the deck of the USS Missouri, and that is the battleship upon which Japan formally surrendered to Allied forces. You are up to date. Sarah, I'll send it back to you. Sue, thank you.
Its members may be trying to lose weight, but MetaFast shares have been gaining significantly, rallying 200% since late March. Up next, we will ask the company CEO about that stock surge and what's happening in the underlying business. And then moving in the opposite direction, pager duty is plunging after hours. Earnings were better than expected, but guidance came in light. The rare cloud name getting punished in this market, down 23 almost percent after hours. We'll be right back. CNBC News Update is sponsored by Comcast Business. Bounce forward at ComcastBusiness.com. We all have a cause that is important to us. With Bonfire, you can easily fundraise by selling custom shirts online, upload your artwork, or create a design right on our website. The orders are sent directly to your buyers. With no inventory needed, you can fundraise from the comfort of your home. In these unique times, you can still make a difference. Fundraise with custom shirts today on bonfire.com. With ServPro, our expert cleaning service helps reduce the spread of viral pathogens. Put the certified ServPro Clean Shield in your window and let your customers know that you're committed to a higher standard of clean. For a free quote, visit ServPro.com. Just leave it on the set. Thanks. You've changed for good. And when it really mattered, you trusted ADT because staying home or venturing out, no one has more ways to help keep what matters most safe. The nation's jobs picture. Did the resurgence of the virus catch up with the resurgent job market? Or did business reopenings put more Americans back to work? August numbers, Friday on Squawk Box. And now watch Squawk Box anytime on demand. Give it up for the big hurt, Frank Thomas. Congratulations, Frank. Hey, Andy Dog, you guys look great. Hey, I feel great too. Ever since you told me about Nugenics Total Tea, I'm crushing my workouts. Thanks to Nugenics, I got more energy, more stamina. Feeling years younger. It's awesome. From the brand that brought you GNC's number one vitality product and product of the year, Nugenics Total Tea is our most powerful man boosting formula ever because it boosts your free testosterone and your total testosterone. To get your complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea, text sign to 42424. I like the competitive edge Nugenics gives me. Hey, me too. You guys over 40, you need Nugenics Total Tea. And she'll like it too. Text sign to 42424 for your complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea. Plus, text now and we'll include a bottle of Nugenics Thermo, our most powerful fat incinerator ever, with key ingredients to help you get back into shape fast, absolutely free. So text S I G N to 42424. Some consumers are taking a renewed interest in staying fit amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, one stock seeing the benefits uh, is health and wellness company Medifast, uh, rallying 222% since the March lows. Joining us uh, now for more, Dan Chard, CEO of Medifast. Uh, Dan, good afternoon to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to be here with you. Uh, so, so clearly, f fantastic numbers, fantastic rally uh, so far this year. Is that more because people are wanting to be healthy and eat better whilst being at home, or, or because, in general, uh, they're, they're wanting to avoid getting sick as well? Well, I think uh, our, our run has been going on for a while. In, in uh, 2018, we were up 66 percent. In uh, 2019, we're up 42 percent. So it's really a reflection of uh, Metafast being very relevant uh, for the uh, the environment, which is an environment where people are very focused on health and wellness and want to get healthy. So what is it about your diet that, that's been attracting people in particular, and how healthy is it? Well, Metafast is the company behind Optavia, which is one of the fastest growing health and wellness community. So we're not uh, a diet. We actually uh, focus on helping people who have failed with diets. And uh, the community that we uh, support it, it is comprised of 36,000 coaches across the world. And, uh, and what the coaches do is they, they, they were, most of them have been clients before and they help other people who want to become healthy. It typically starts with achieving their healthy weight. Uh, learn a set of healthy habits. The first habit they learn is the habit of healthy eating, and we have products to help reinforce those habits so that they can achieve a lifestyle change that can be maintained for the rest of their lives. What sort of qualifications, Dan, do your, do your coaches have? Really, it's it's uh, most of them have been successful on the program before, so they're in essence sharing the story of what helped them. We have a uh, certification process that helps them uh, learn 
the basics of nutrition and coaching. And then they have uh, coach mentors who have been doing this for years, uh, who help them learn how to be effective in teaching people new healthy habits. Dan, how do you look at, at the permanence of what this pandemic is going to do to our behavior and our psyches and how that might impact your business beyond when we get a vaccine? Yeah, I think for, for us, as I mentioned, uh, Metafast has been growing for several years. I think we, uh, as a country and kind of the world in general, has been struggling with uh, health and wellness, and we're just starting to be educated. I think the current pandemic has created a, uh, an increased awareness of just how important it is to be healthy. And so we see ourselves as being relevant before the pandemic. We're certainly relevant during the pandemic. And we, we think that the Metafast and, and our coaches uh, through Optavia will remain extremely relevant even after this passes. 88% reported feeling stress. Uh, certainly can relate to that. Dan Shard, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Up next, it looks like Bumble could have some big plans on deck for 2021, and it's got all of Wall Street buzzing today. The details when Closing Bell comes right back. Our retirement plan with Voya gives us confidence. So we can spend a bit today knowing we're prepared for tomorrow.